Hello everybody, Anthony here from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. Welcome to these types of reading skills and strategies. We're going to go through a bunch of them, and they all work well together, really, really well, if you bring them together, and that's what we'll talk about today. But uh, as we're warming up, waiting to see who shows up, let me know in the chat where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, how you're feeling, and get prepared if you have any questions of any kind for memory. Let me know that you can actually hear me, that everything is um, okay. Hit the thumbs up. If you're watching the replay, obviously, hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the uh, discussion how things are going with you. Say hello. And how about that Marvel Avengers showdown at the end? What would you think about that? That was quite interesting. There's lots of memory palace elements in there to go through and talk about and discuss a lot of memory things going on in that movie and how that it's trying to tie together so many strands and really places a lot of heavy demand on your memory of the whole Marvel universe. So that was quite uh, fascinating to see. Um, and you know, watching movies is not that unrelated to reading in uh, the, some of the things that we want to do in order to strategically read more effectively and properly and uh, with greater focus and clarity and outcomes. Reading is not just reading books. It's also reading film. And as you may or may not know, I taught film studies for memory many years, for memory years also, <laughs> I remember them. And uh, there was a lot of uh, interesting fun and games with that in terms of better uh, ability to understand information and um, had a lot of fun teaching uh, those uh, skills of assessing movies. Chanel is here. Good to see you. What's up with me? Well, I'm just still thinking through the Marvel Universe. You know, it made a tragic error, which is that it has a deus ex machina ending, which is mm, shoehorned in, perhaps. But um, anyway, it was fun. And, <laughs> and, and it is an interesting movie when you think about the memory demands that it makes. David's in the house. Good to see you, David. And you say you're down to about 14 minutes on memorizing cards, way down from 35 to memorizing a week or so to, to memorize a week or so ago. Thank you for your continued efforts. That's amazing, David. Everybody hit the thumbs up for David. And uh, I don't want to clap too loud to cause distortion and hurt anyone's ears, but I'm clapping huge in my heart and my head. That's awesome, David. Thanks for sharing. And, uh, you know, I've been on a card uh, spree myself and really interesting. I don't know um, if you're tracking. I mean, obviously you are, so you can uh, you you know that. But I've been tracking now in the new snapshot journal that uh, I acquired, thanks to uh, someone here in uh, in Brisbane mentioning one. And then lo and behold, my friend Nick and I saw well, he saw it first in uh, the bookstore and let me get the first copy, and uh, he uh, ordered a, a different one. And I also have in this box a new journal, which will unbox at some point in the future. So make sure to stick around if you're interested in journals, because I think they're one of the best memory tools under the sun. I mean, they're so good. And uh, there's lots, uh, lots to say about uh, using them. Chanel says, I haven't seen the movie yet. I'm on the Game of Thrones kick right now. So probably we'll have to leave at a quarter till nine Eastern Standard Time USA in order to watch episode three of season eight of Game of Thrones. I want to see who dies. Oh, how, how vicious. <laughs> I, you've revealed your priorities publicly. And now we know. Now we know. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that, though. And enjoy. And uh, obviously, Something like that universe is a huge memory challenge and demand as well. And if you really observe how your memory works, you can learn so many clues that you can then direct over to what it is that uh, you do with language learning. I know you do a lot of language learning, but anything you want to study, if you really just notice how your memory works in relation to movies, you can learn a lot more about how your memory can work for reading books. And uh, that's what we'll talk about today and draw upon my uh, history with film studies as well, because there's a lot of parallels. But film studies is not something that you do without reading. You need to read a lot. I had to read so much. You have no idea the piles of books that I had to go through in order to understand film history, 
to understand film theory, to understand film criticism, and uh, to understand the technological aspects of sound, of color, of all kinds of things. It was a, a massive amount, and I needed a number of strategies in order to get through it all. And not only just get through it, because getting through something is nothing. You just flip pages and you get through it. you got to actually remember what you read there, and you need to be able to recall it in a way that creates new knowledge, right? Because just parroting things is, is great. It has its place in the world, but you've got to also combine things. You've got to make connections, and so we're going to talk about that today as well. And um, likewise with consuming lots of Marvel Universe stuff or Game of Thrones stuff, the real deal is, is if you can combine it to make your own new creations and understand the deep structural narrative thing. So I mentioned today, sorry if it was a bit of a spoiler if you haven't seen it, but the Deus, Mach Deus Ex Machina ending, you know, you see it like that if you know narratology, if you know the structure. And then you can create new knowledge and think, well, if I was going to write a story like that, what would be the alternative to the Deus Ex Machina ending? And then you can think about, you know, the architectonic tautology and all this narrative stuff that's going on in there. But you have to read books to figure that out, and you have to be able to read them well, and you have to be able to understand that narrative architecture, right? And so one of the one of the things that I was able to produce from reading was a, an actually very nice little mini career as a story consultant because I can say, you know, all right, so um, what's the conflict here between the you know the conscious need and the or the the unconscious need and the and the um, driving ambition? Where exactly is the the um, the the paradox or or the dilemma between these two things and where is the situation of delay when is the crisis coming how is the crisis going to work in terms of the decision and action is there going to be an underworld is there not is there going to be a gathering of allies is there not is there going to be two calls to adventure how exactly is the refusal of the call blah 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 and all and so on and so on and then you know you have all the stuff at the battle leading up to the battle when exactly the self revelation happens is it tragic is it comedic etc so this is a, a lot of fun, but I had to read tons of books in order to, to figure that out. It wasn't just watching movies. All right. Chanel says, I have a degree in filmmaking, particularly directing, screenwriting, and producing from the Los Angeles Film School. Film studies was one of my favorite classes, along with producing and working with actors. Excellent, Chanel. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I assume that you read a lot of books as well. Let me know um, what some of your favorites were. Mine really was Signatures of the Visible by uh, Frederick Jameson. Don't agree with his politics, but I really like that book. It's a very good book for figuring out how to read some of the structure of narrative and uh, the deep mise-en-scene, so to speak. All right, if you're joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. We're going to talk about types of reading skills and strategies and I got example books that we're going to look at because not all books are the same and uh, not all of them have the same sort of strategic outcome. And uh, as I mentioned, some books come in boxes <laughs> and they're not the normal standard style of book at all. And as we go through this, let me know if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have things you want to say and always good to know where you are in the world and how things are going for you, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and um, let's get started. So the first thing that uh, we want to think about as a major, massively powerful reading skill and a strategy is priming. And so priming, some people call it pre-reading. Really, I think the reason we don't want to call it pre-reading, but we want to call it priming, is because it's not reading in the same sense. I mean, it involves reading, but it's not really reading. It's priming. It's 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 sort of like, you know, when you have to use a tool, you got to prime them sometimes. You've got to add grease to the, to the gears, you know, get things moving. And in this case, priming has a lot to do with making connections in advance of, of making connections and understanding the context or the paratext, as it's sometimes called, that surround the book. Now, this idea of the paratext comes from Gerard Genet, um, and it's spelled like this. And one of my favorite books is just this 
dense study of paratext. So I highly uh, recommend that you check that out. Um, and not all books have the same paratext, but when you understand paratext and their relationship to different kinds of books, then you can analyze books a lot quicker just by looking at them. And uh, then you're going to do priming differently. So if you're going to do priming for a complete Sanskrit, which is a, a grammar book, that's going to be different than a novel, right? Uh, one would hope. And it's also going to be different than, say, a, um, a book filled with words, um, like this one and this one with Sanskrit, right? So priming is going to change depending on what it is. And uh, it would work even differently with something like this on the shadows of the ideas and uh, maybe something different with the memory connection, right? There's going to be similarities. And incidentally, thanks for everybody who's been uh, on the email list grabbing the last copies. I told everybody on YouTube that when uh, the time was coming, uh, they would be gone and pretty close to gone. So thanks for that. I'm signing copies left, right, and center. And uh, it's, it's really um, a lot of fun to uh, do that for people. So thank you. David says, in grade school, I remember there was a big push for SQ3R, scan, question, read, reread, and recite. This is 40 years ago, never used it. Oh, well, David, I'm going to uh, thank you for making that connection because this certainly connects with that. And there's a lot of logic and wisdom to it, but I don't think it's robust enough. And scanning is, I'm just going to leave that word mostly out of here, scanning, skimming. It, 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 it comes up, it's useful, and it, we'll see how it factors into what we're going to talk about. But generally, that's just not robust enough, right? So first of all, we we'll just think about priming. And priming is literally reading the paratext, in my view. And so the paratext is the text that surrounds the text. Now, again, you can read Gerard Genet's uh, book all about paratext. Highly recommend it. Amazing. Um, even though it might, it might test some attention spans, don't let your attention span ruin your chance at knowing a lot of stuff about books. And, and, and think of how it translates to movies because uh, that's very powerful. Um, but it's literally reading the back text and that's often, you don't have to do this in any particular order, but that's usually where I start. Maybe a lot of people do as well. But, um, what do you notice there? Well, for one thing, you can notice the publisher. You can notice sometimes the design illustration and, you know, wow, design illustration by ghost. That's interesting. It's just a little thing. Um, but it, all, it sets the stage. It gives you different things. Because when I see that ghost, well, I think of the band Ghost, right? I'm already making connections. Start to hear, dun, 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 right? Now I've got this little bit of a soundtrack for the book going on and a, narr a, a mnemonic palette, let's say, upon which we can paint because the characters, uh, the band Ghost has these kind of characters, right? And it actually kind of fits. One of the things you'll notice is there's a lot of what I sometimes think of as magnetic serendipity because, you know, the guy, the singer of Ghost, he's kind of like a Pope dude. And, uh, well, here we go, right? Quid, quid pro quo. Anyway, I, I would just start to do this, start to make a palette for oneself. And then either go directly to the back of the book and start going through the index. I'm not going to read the index, uh, word for word, but I'm going to look through it. Here's where maybe we'll use uh, the word scanning. Uh, I don't really think of it as scanning, though. I'm just like seeing if my eyes catch on something. So I see Shakespeare. Oh, that's interesting. I know some things about Shakespeare. And more than see the word Shakespeare, start to think like what era that is, right? Um, and think, you know, well, why is Shakespeare coming up in this? I see Plutarch. That makes more sense to, to this sort of era that this book is talking about and so on. And go through the index and uh, just make some little signals for the mind, Circus Maximus and so on. That's very interesting. Um, then often these books will have a bibliography or works cited and just jam through that and see what some of the books are that, that are referenced here and see if you know anything. See if there are pre-cognitive neural networks that connect you to the world that this author is operating in, right? And so... 
religion of Romans, I think in my head, yeah, well, I did do a lot of religious studies in my PhD, but the Romans was not that strong, so I might want to follow up on that book in particular, um, and and so on. Um, then there's a beautiful page that is called the Colophon page, and this is a very, very important page because it tells you the date of the book. Now, just as you can find clues all over books, and I gave you the example of the ghost clue, this has a, a date, right? And so when you look at that date, you can think, well, what else happened in that year? So here we have 2016, you can start to think through that. Maybe there's sometimes multiple dates, but these are tools. What movies did I see in 2016? Where was I in 2016, etc. These are mnemonic tools. So you can think through that more. And then when you're starting to read, you can think, okay, so we got the band Ghost, we got 2016, and so I was in Berlin and start to you know, think of Berlin memory palaces, etc. that might be handy here. Then there's the table of contents, which is really good to not scan, but actually read every single listing here. And one of the things that you can do is, you know, allow yourself to jump around a little bit because you're like, oh, education and philosophy on page 115. Bam, I'm going straight to check that out, right? And, uh, and look through it. Um, maybe actually just read it. Often I will go and just read a chapter. Another strategy in priming is just to go and read the conclusion. Now, in this case, this book has an epilogue, and um, it's not really a full conclusion, but uh, in this case, I, I, I just looked at it very briefly because it wasn't the kind of conclusion that I might read thoroughly, which is the one where the author brings together all of the uh, ideas and basically summarizes it together. And then you can think, well, if that's all that this was about, I don't need to read it, <laughs> you know, because I see what the author concluded on. They've recited their, their, their path. And uh, that conclusion is really not that substantial enough to really warrant reading the journey to how the author got there. Um, and that is not always possible because you might need to actually read the book for um, your assignments or whatever. But it still gives you a bit of a, of a sense of is that conclusion, does it really warrant the journey? And in what way does it warrant the journey? And how much attention are you going to actually pay to the ultimate book in terms of the substantial conclusion that they arrive at? So not all books are created that way, and you can't always do that, but it is something to really think of, of when you've got massive amounts of text to go through, such as in school. Now, would that work for a novel? This is still Alice here, which is a, a, a novel about someone who gets um, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, I'd seen the movie already, now I'm reading the book, and uh, it's pretty heart-wrenching. But uh, you can do the same sort of thing. Now, you don't want to be like, oh, the butler did it and ruin the reading experience if you want to keep things as a surprise. But um, still, one thing that's interesting that you find out here is that there's like, you know, a, uh, a reading guide for, for discussions. And, you know, if you were a teacher, assignments you might want to give. So that's kind of interesting. And uh, again, noting what the date is. Uh, so, you know, this... Uh, the actual story here starts in 2003, and I think I saw that it was published in 2007, yeah. Um, and I think it was 2003, uh, and it's starting at the school year, yeah, 2003. And, you know, just make a, make a note of that. Um, and you can use your memory tools. You can use the major system to help you remember that. So you can do priming with novels as well, and in a way that doesn't ruin the surprise. And it's the same thing. Knowing the publisher can be very, very interesting and powerful, especially if you're a university student, because, you know, when you're thinking, well, what am I going to write about in this uh, essay? Well, knowing the publisher can give you a whole paragraph to write about. You know, this is Simon & Schuster. You do some research on Simon & Schuster. Oh, Simon, Simon & Schuster, they often publish novels like this, and this belongs to this category over there. You find out who the um, editor of the novel was, etc. But if you don't pay attention to it, you're never going to even think that you could actually devote some time there. Because one thing students struggle with so much is what the heck are they going to write about? They got 10 pages to write and, you know, they've got to fill all this stuff and they never think about paratext. They don't know anything about it. Their teachers aren't teaching them. And yet there's so much rich detail there. Who the publisher is actually matters. There's a story there. Who edited it matters. There's a story there. Like, for example, Cormac McCarthy is not one dude. He has a very, very specific editor who takes a huge amount of 
credit for that masterful writing that is on display in that work, you know? So knowing a little bit about that and knowing how editing works gives you lots to talk about, lots to think about, lots to write about, etc. Because writing is, is, uh, is its own world and there, there's so much to think about. So priming can help you with that just to be observant. And um, sometimes also there, there are typographical things like this has a butterfly on every page, which is very, very interesting to notice, to think about, wonder about what how that decision was made and so forth. And then you might have a technical manual like Complete Sanskrit where, um, wow, there's such a difference here because this is this is not like a, a conclusion you know nobody's making an argument in here as such it's just a technical manual on how Sanskrit works and it's very very complex and nonetheless I primed it anyway because you know you you notice features of the book so it's got actually some uh, uh, an, an unusual index structure and uh um, very, very interesting how it's organized. And knowing something about that beforehand helps you actually use the book better. And one of the problems is, is that when you read the in the introduction how the book is structured and how it works and so forth, that can seem incredibly vague, useless, something you skip over, something you don't use, unless you've actually looked at it first. And then when you read their description, you have a map already in your head because you yourself have gone through it. So that's some stuff about priming. Let's uh, check in with the chat. Say hello to everybody. Maricella is here. Good to see you, Maricella. Said you're uh, having trouble with that on Chrome. Well, that's something for the Super Learner team. Please be in touch with them. Uh, but uh, sorry that you're having that experience. I'm sure that they'll be responsive uh, uh, very soon. Thanks for, uh, thanks for raising that, and please direct that to them. Claiming Life is in the house. Good to see you. You say anyone who knows knowledge, who enjoys knowledge, should know the basics of different publishing companies and print houses. Great point. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for noticing that and uh, helping amplify that point, because it's a a matter we often don't think about, but it is one of the most important things to know, because there is a form content and. Um, media infrastructure that shapes knowledge. And there are books that have been broken by this process, and there are books that have been made by this process. And it's very, very fascinating, but also it is part of knowledge. And if you care about knowledge, you will, you will certainly, as you say, learn about it. So, you know, I was very, very fortunate that I worked, uh, I had a had an internship with Bloomsbury in New York, so I learned a lot about it from the inside. And I wasn't very happy about exactly what they gave me at the time to do, but over time I became very, very happy about it because it was precisely what I needed to know. <laughs> it just didn't know that that was what I needed to know at the time. And uh, that's not to uh, put any sort of mystical woo-woo on the universe, but it's peculiar peculiar but um yeah that was an amazing experience i learned a ton i learned a ton and also just you know beautifully by accident i became very interested in narratology and came across uh, Genet and uh the the paratex concept which i used a great deal in my first ma where i wrote about novelizations that was my project uh which is this obscure, odd, strange little world. And you learn a lot about the publishing world through that topic as well, because that's the strange world where people write novels based on movies rather than movies adapted based on uh, novels. And then, of course, sometimes there are novels based on movies that are based on novels <laughs> in the first place. It's a really wild world. And some of those novelizations have very interesting histories and stories when you poke around. And I was able to interview uh, quite a few people for that project and learn a ton, especially the difference between Canadian novelizations of Canadian movies or American novelizations of Canadian movies and novelizations of American movies, which sometimes are done by Canadians and sometimes done by uh, people from England, etc. So um, a little, a little insider thing. If you're interested, is that the novelization of Existence, the David Cronenberg movie, is actually done by Christopher Priest, 
under a, uh, a pseudonym, and he's a really accomplished uh, novelist. And the changes he makes to that story, <laughs> they're enough to, they're, they're really wild. Anyway, fascinating stuff. All right, so Sean is here saying hello from Jersey. All right, good to see you here, uh, Sean. I have memory palaces in New Jersey. Excellent. Dexter is in the house. You say, the most beautiful thing happened to me. I was studying physics and was able to see in my head forces and magnetic fields and cycles. I think this is because of the image visualization. Amazing. Awesome. And how nice that they are magnetic fields as opposed to grass fields or other kinds of fields. <laughs> Excellent. So another giant applause for you. Hit thumbs up if you haven't already for Dexter's accomplishment. Amazing and wonderful. Hockey is here. In uh, It's Adam in Bathurst, New South Wales. Uh, I'm assuming that's New South Wales. I never usually catch your live streams, only in the reply. I have been doing Super Learn with Jonathan Levy, which has been interesting. Awesome. Thank you for being here, and thanks for saying hello. And uh, thank you uh, for joining us. I'm glad you can be live rather than a replay. Let us know if you have any questions and uh, comments and things to say. All right, so that's priming. I mean, we can go to priming with oodles of examples. Obviously, there are some books that, well, actually, I'm not sure that there are any books that, that resist or or in any way uh, say that we shouldn't prime. I, I can't think of any, but maybe some will come to mind. Um, even if you get a Mad Magazine, that could probably work. Now, in terms of planning and preparing, Here's a beautiful memory palace by Patricia, who shared a whole bunch with me, actually. And uh, this one just, I love it. And I, I probably use it in my new book. She said that that would be okay. And uh, wonderful, beautiful memory palace. And some of the other ones that she submitted, I would just make a book just of hers. They're so beautiful. Um, so if you have memory palace drawings and you want to maybe consider, have them being considered to be in the next book, make sure I've seen them. And let me know, because uh, I want to have a bunch of them from you all. And I've got, I have thousands of them. Uh, it's just amazing, but uh, never too late for more. And uh, they don't have to be as uh, beautiful and pristine as this. I just did one the other day, and uh, <laughs> I'm no artist, and I don't try to be, but it works. And um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. And yeah, in, in case that you uh, never thought about it, you don't have to draw them in memory journals. You can also draw them in uh, memory palaces related to particular learning projects that you might want to work on, like the one I'm working on now. So that's a lot of fun. Um, all right. So planning and preparing, obviously, in the magnetic memory method world means having some kind of memory palace strategy, some sort of memory palace network in place. And if you have any skepticism about what this can do for you and will do for you if you just dive in, and I'm so glad that Dexter was here to share about how um, he was studying physics and was able to see stuff in his head because there's another story I want to share, just how much this preparation and planning that I talk about with memory palaces can do for you. Uh, Robert here said that um, he takes, I take a large course load, 31 hours per trimester, 93 hours a year, and it was difficult to manage all the material and stay sane. Now I enjoy studying and learning new material. It is pretty awesome. I really enjoy this. The Magnetic Mary Method makes learning not suck. <laughs> I like that. Found some love of learning in very dense subjects. It is beautiful. It is beautiful indeed. My ability to create new images with Densely encoded material and my ability to recall the information without struggling at all has improved. Below is some motivation. Now check this out. This is amazing. I feel like I'm bragging, but I hope it isn't received that way. It is me saying thanks for making things better and easier. And so if you look at the scores to the right, that's the class average. And if you look to the scores to the left, that's Robert's score after taking the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass. So his average on that first neuroanatomy exam in uh, the third exam of spring 2019 was 74.91%. His score was 96%. And then on uh, another neuroanatomy exam, which is one, it was 66.71% class average, and he has 92% score. So he says there at the bottom, do it 
as soon as possible. It's all, in case that's too small for you to see, do it as soon as possible. No matter where you are, what situation you're in, the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass makes learning easier. So thanks for sharing that, Robert Spraggs. And uh, he's uh, shared more of his journey with me. There's uh, his name there. Um, really uh, love when people ask questions. They ask questions from the journey. They're not overthinking it, but they're strategizing. They're working their way through. And there you go. There's the results. The only thing that, that he said is, please, you know, hide the name of my instructor, which I was happy to do with some little, uh, you know, magic there with the Photoshop. But um, that's that's what he submitted and uh, amazing. And all it takes is really knowing how to handle the books and how to memorize the information and how to perform in the exam. So I am really, really excited to, uh, to create this kind of result for people all the time and uh, be part of it. But ultimately, it's them that create the result because they take the knowledge, they put it into action, and uh, that's what happens. So congratulations. And a big clap. Don't want to clap too loud, deafen anyone, but uh, hit the thumbs up for Robert if you haven't hit that thumbs up yet because that's absolutely fantastic outcome. All right. So let's check in with the chat before that we uh, carry on with some more reading skills and strategies. But um, that's um, a great story. Uh, always happy to receive stories. Send yours in as, uh, as soon as you can when you got it. And if you have one that's been lingering in your mind and you haven't shared it, please do because we got a world to help here. We're not going to save everyone, but we do the best to save all that we can. And it's just a simple matter sometimes of hearing a story from somebody else. So I really want to thank Robert and everyone who submitted their story, put their picture on there. And if you've got exam scores, oh, all the better, because that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So let's check in with our chat. If you're joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking, how uh, things are going. And if you have questions, Physico is in the house. He says he likes to plan his reading in, in pages and then record myself reading the text. Then I hear, I read and hear the recording at the same time. Yeah, I used to do stuff like that. I didn't use pages because it didn't, as far as I know, it didn't exist at the time. Um, but uh, yeah. And Reclaiming Life says, this example was also read in one of your podcasts recently, correct? I believe so, yeah. Um, I don't always memorize which... Uh, <laughs> which of the testimonials or podcast reviews that have come on, but I do my best to, to, uh, to, to make sure that they're gathered somewhere on the testimonials page. So if you haven't been to the testimonials page on magneticmarymethod.com forward slash testimonials, you might want to check it out because I've been hearing from a lot of people that that inspires them and uh, they just go and visit it. And there's uh, a picture of someone with a tiger there also, which is great. I love that tiger. Um, but basically, you want to understand that these techniques work when you do it. And it's not, it, it's it's about the people. What's to notice there is that they took the knowledge and they applied it. And then they improve. All right, so Andres is here. Good to see you. Thanks for saying hello. USSR, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So thanks for asking and being interested. It is one of the most powerful tools for reading and understanding what you read that you will ever encounter. That's coming up in a minute. Hockey says, I'm using Magnetic Memory Method for my uni class in combination with Anki flashcard program. I find this combination really beneficial. Yeah, you know, some people, thanks for raising that, by the way, Adam. Um, if uh, I remembered, I made a mental note there to connect you with your name as Adam. Yep. Go back in my scroll here. Um, so one of the things that, you know, people think that I am against space repetition and against space repetition software. That's not exactly true. What I'm concerned about is that people don't use space repetition software properly. And so space repetition software, use of it is actually a skill. And there's no need to divide that skill from a memory palace or at least basics of association. And I don't uh, want my personal preference to not use those devices to somehow suggest that they can't or won't work. And it's never about 
uh, spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is what we need, but we need it strategically. We need it refined, and we need to develop discipline around it and have skills for it. And that the problem is, is that, and my criticism is, is that so many of these softwares have two, if not more, Achilles heels. The first is the time that it takes for me to put this in software doesn't make any sense because it's done, you know, within seconds. I don't, I don't like it for that reason. I just really don't like the time. The other thing that I don't like is I don't like the small window. I think that the smaller the window, and you don't have to use it on a small window. You can use it on a big, you know, screen if you want. But most people are using it on a small window. And the smaller that space, the user error goes up for, for one thing. And um, I personally have written entire books on a simple thing on an iPhone called the plain text app. So it's not like I'm against using stuff. I've written entire books this way. Many, many, most of my podcast episodes uh, and blog posts are written with my thumbs like this, or they were for many years uh, in Berlin. Uh, that was my favorite thing to do. It's a special, not a special iPhone, but it's just a special because I take it off the internet and it, it just doesn't get notifications. It never received calls, which is kind of like a waste on the one hand, cause that's what it's for. But, uh, it was just for writing and so the plain text app, which only goes online to sync it up to Dropbox and then recover it there and put it through editing and etc. So it's not like I'm opposed to using technology. I love it. I love it. But when you take those same devices and these apps and you're talking about knowledge and you're talking about time, right? If you can't input stuff as quickly as you can just by scribbling it on a card, this is just, to me, madness. And there, the smaller the screen, the more the error entry error goes up for me. And I'm not going to borrow anybody else's cards and just like mindlessly pass them through my eyes. I won't be invested in them, etc. So... That's all very, very important stuff. The other part of it is that there's there's issues in terms of a lot of these apps. They um, have coins in them. They have advertisements in them, etc. All kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and there's a surveillance issue. And it's not like I'm not surveilled by technology. There's things I actively do in order to make sure that the machines find me. But... Um, <laughs> I don't really, you know, go into apps that much just just on the surveillance angle of things. But everybody has to pick their own uh, battles and and so on. And it's if it's used well, if it's used intelligently and strategically, it certainly can work, but then that's the other problem. It's in an, in a device that's meant to hijack your attention to many many other things. And so when I do my review of Sam Harris's Waking Up app, which I will contest that it should be called an app, it's more like an audiobook in a in a icon, I, audiobook in an icon. Um, it, it, it it's just there, and I've talked to many people. It's not just my own thing, but they're like, "Yeah, I was using it, and then I got a phone call." Well, that's not a meditation app. <laughs> It's it if it doesn't restrict interruptions, then it's uh it's really really uh against itself. And likewise with uh with these things. Then another problem with them is that do you really obey its notification to you? Oh, it's time to review. Wouldn't it be better to build the skill of reviewing of your own accord rather than being annoyed? at a time when you're doing something else and be like, yeah, later, later, later. We all know about later, right? So there's different strategies that I talk a lot about. And uh, it's just faster, it's more efficient, it's less difficult to ignore, and it's more beautiful, and it maps much faster and easier into memory palaces. And on top of that, it is just what I like. <laughs> and I'm very open about that, but it, it, it gets, uh, gets me much better results. And I don't have a, a deep resentment of spending time on technology, even though it is technology. There's no way that this is not technology. Um, and of course, I only use that uh, in certain contexts as well, because you can always just go straight into a memory palace once you have those skills. So again, it's a matter of picking your battles, having a, having nuanced multiple levels of skill set and being able to put them out there, pump them out there when you need them. 
All right. So that's uh, my speech about that. And uh, I appreciate you mentioning it because uh, I, I apparently love the sound of my own voice uh, on speeches about software, <laughs> spaced repetition software. There, no one can criticize me that I love the sound of my own voice because I just admitted it. All right. So reclaiming life says to physical awesome people don't give enough time to reading out loud these days yeah that's right and that's one of the reasons why i've been reading out loud on some of these live streams because i'm sure that people are not even giving enough time to reading these days which is a problem which gets us to ussr after we catch up with determining the type of the text so i've sort of already uh, mentioned that like obviously a, a, a sanskrit book is not a novel and you know that implicitly right but you can also do something in your mind that helps you with categories. And this goes to the point that Reclaiming Life helped to amplify, which is that knowledge of the industry, knowledge of categories, knowledge of genre is something that can help you a lot. And, um, you know, I've thought a lot about genre. I've done a whole course on genre uh, and I may release it in full. Part of it has been released on my other YouTube channel, but genre is a powerful tool for memory as well. And so just having the thought in mind of what genre something belongs to is very, very good for your learning. It's a perfect reading strategy. And you can have your own idea of what genre this novel might belong to, or what genre of language learning book that this belongs to, or what genre of um, language study book this belongs to, etc., or what genre of memory training the memory connection belongs to, as opposed to on the shadows of the ideas, right? You can think about their genre. You can think about their goal. You can think about how that their structure helps them achieve that goal. And you can think about all kinds of things that are about the text itself. And that is can be your own designations, but there are also often industry designations that can be useful to know. And when you have both of those in mind, you're going to read better. You're going to read better. You're going to have a framework upon which your reading um, lies. And uh, <laughs> now we can get to USSR. And no, that's not what I mean. I mean uninterrupted, silent, sustained reading. And so, yes, it was a joke when I was in school when I learned that, that uh, that is uh, <laughs> somehow related to, uh, to geography and political uh, borders and all that sort of stuff. But no, it's uninterrupted, silent, sustained reading reading for depth for depth reading now depth reading is something that is really really important because when people learn about speed reading and all that stuff they skim and they scan and they don't actually ever read the pro the text properly so depth reading what is this well it's actually reading the book right now we're going to talk about other strategies and and we'll talk about you know, we'll use this word skimming here, but there's intelligent skimming and it has context and it has place, but only if there's also depth reading. And depth reading is literally reading the book from beginning to end, right? And that is important, not all the time, but it's important most of the time, right? And so one of the things that you want to do is have these other tools that we've already talked about in place. You've determined the type of the text. You've somehow done your done your your um, priming. You're all you've got you've got some established networks both in your own person and where what other authors are being mentioned in that book. What other authors are being actually deliberately cited uh, in terms of the bibliography. And you have this this framework, right? And uh, it's really 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 important. So <laughs> physical says Stephen Krashen loves that USSR. He took out the, out the U though. Well, the U is the most important part. So let's maybe talk about that a bit more because what does uninterrupted mean? It means no apps. It means no devices. It means nothing more elaborate than either this, a journal, or some index cards, right? And you, you can pick which works best for you. I have different ones that I use depending on what it is that I'm doing, what's going to be the outcome. So if I'm going to write about something, I'll typically have index cards. If I'm going to memorize the stuff, I'll probably have want to have index cards. If I'm just taking notes to 
be part of just a kind of je ne sais quoi. It's a, it's a, uh, it's sometimes good just to take notes. <laughs> period. Um, then I will, I will per prefer to have something like my trusty and soon ratty and tatty um, notebook. And uh, I use pencils, by the way, typically mechanical, because um, they're they're fun. Um, but it, it, it's it's important to to take to take notes, and it's part of depth reading, I would say. And you don't have to take them the first read, and often it's better not to, just to read uninterrupted, uninterrupted. Now, one of the things is that a lot of really good books will interrupt themselves with footnotes or endnotes and or endnotes. They, they may have both, and that can be very, very important. Uh, and that can be a useful form of interruption. So if you saw the book review on learning how, or learning how to learn the book, I um, talked about why and how footnotes can be good for you if you interrupt yourself there. But by lack of interruptions, I mean no notifications, no devices that even could possibly interrupt you. And if you have a family, as I know some people do, there's nothing wrong with just saying, I am going to read now. Please do not interrupt me or go somewhere. Uh, if I if I just need to, I will go and take my book and just go read in the park. And no device, no one can call me and just say, look, I'm not going to bring my phone. Uh, if you need me, this is the park that I'll be in. And if I'm not in that park, it's just because I've walked to the other one or I've gone to you know, the washroom or I've done whatever I'm doing and just, I just let my wife know it is, uh, it's just common sense. I mean, I, maybe I'm an eighties kid, but I remember when we didn't need to be in constant contact, we'd just say, yeah, I'll meet you at four 30 over by the payphone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then you could just call people, uh, people's parents or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm a certain generation and I realize that and recognize that in my preferences. But um, nonetheless, you can go without a device. You can read uninterrupted. You can do it somewhere silent and you can do it in a way that's sustained. And actually taking notes can sustain your focus and attention if you want to. Um, and it's a, it's a great strategy for that. And then, of course, the reading part means actually reading. And so physical mentioned reading out loud. When I haven't been able to focus, I read out loud. Sometimes I'll read out loud for a few minutes uh, just to make sure I get something. Rather than go, oh, I don't get this. This is hard. Reading it out loud and trying to work it out is very, very important and powerful. Very, very important and powerful. Furkan says, what if you have aphantasia? Well, first of all, thank you for being here. Good to see you and interesting question. You will want to go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash aphantasia and you'll want to also uh, listen to an interview with Alec Figora um, where we talk about his ideas about curing aphantasia and then you will really be posed with the question, so what? Why would that be a barrier? Why would that stop you? It wouldn't stop you at all. And... Uh, I don't have aphantasia myself, but I'm very low on the visual threshold. Lynn Kelly recently me uh, mentioned that she feels that she has aphantasia. She's a memory competitor. She's an author. She's a very well-read individual. And so what if you have aphantasia? What's stopping you? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a controversial subject because I think that there are people on the verge of monetizing it as a disease, and it ain't. Uh, in my view, and I don't think it ever will be because I think that some people are being duped into thinking poorly about what it is to have a mental experience. There are there, Visualization is not what people think it is. But ultimately, I don't know. I only know that people are very, very easily seduced into following ideas for which not enough evidence exists. <laughs> that there is such a thing and uh if you really really think through your mental experience i think you'll you'll quickly find that nobody sees pictures in their mind that's not what seeing pictures is and uh i could be biased because i don't see pictures in my mind either and i'd never seen it as a problem i've seen it as a solution and thank god because it's too slow <laughs> all right 
Oh, and uh, in terms of finding time and blocking off time, as David suggests, wake up at 5 a.m. And uh, yes, many of your many of your family members will sleep until seven or later. It's the only way to get anything done with three kids. Well, thanks for sharing that. I don't know what that's like, but um, here's uh, something that I don't have three kids, but I do have a wife. And yeah, I get up early because I like to meditate uninterrupted in a silent and sustained way. And uh, it's just actually it doesn't really matter if she's awake when I meditate or not, but I just have a preference for it because it is uninterrupted and silent and sustained. But the beauty of being a meditator is is that you're very hard to interrupt. There really aren't interruptions. Uh, and if there are, then you have to give your head a shake because the meditation ain't working that day or that minute or that hour. So um, Reclaiming Life or Physico says, fountain pens are pure art, very cool to do, but you need to focus so much on the writing that you can forget to read. Well... Who knows if that's a problem or not? Maybe you can f learn to focus on both. There is such a thing as dual process focusing. Harry Kinney, check him out. All right, so that's uh, depth reading, what it's all about. And uh, there's a lot of fantasies out there about getting around depth reading and so forth. But yeah, here's, here's why you ultimately don't want to fall into those traps. What you want to do is... You want to understand that, and we'll talk about this as other reading strategies as we go forward, but you want to understand that you're you're going to want to elicit other things while you're reading. So depth reading and, and being uninterrupted is important because you're going to elicit connections. You're going to make connections as you go along. You're going to be reading your mind at the same time as you're reading the text. You're going to do them at the same time. That's what depth reading is. And so that's what intelligent skimming is. It's not really skimming at all, but it's actually going through a text and asking yourself, and it's best done after you've read the text, not before, after you've depth read the text, not before, but whenever you do it, you're doing it in such a way that you're asking yourself about connections. What connects? What connects? What contrasts? What's similar? What's different? But what connects, what connects? That's really what intelligent skimming is all about. And intelligent skimming is also timed and it is done with a goal in mind, which is that you're searching for something, typically a connection. Furkan says, I have tried many speed reading techniques, even speed reading for dummies. Then I found your site and I'm so hooked. Well, thank you for saying that. Thank you for being hooked. And just uh, let me know in the comments on those posts if you have questions. Um, and we'll do what we can to help you so so that you get even more hooked on learning and memory for life because it is a skill that we want to be using for life. We want to absolutely dive in and take it with us because just as you can do depth reading in any topic, you can do depth reading in memory, you can do depth of analysis of your own memory and the skills that are out there, and you can grow it over time, which is a great brain health strategy for life. And not only that, but it's just a great psychological health strategy so that you feel great. You have lots of great chemicals associated in your brain from habits and from from memory, you know, and so forth. And you just, you have a much better experience the more that you make memory part of your life. And uh, there are some people, I have to admit, who have horrible experiences from memory, but that can be changed. And probably the best weapon for changing it is your memory itself, which is kind of interesting, isn't it? I think so. So I was kind of um, disappointed to hear an interview about superior memory on an Australian radio program the other day when really they were talking about autism, not uh, superior memory. But nonetheless, that person is having a magical experience and very good that their experience is not as as horrible as uh, some other people have had, or at least that they describe they have. Ultimately, I don't know, but I'm referring to the hyperthermesia case of Jill Price, who um, seems to be tortured by by that. But in any case, that's not going to happen to most of us because <laughs> we probably if we if we had a hyperthermesia pill, we could any negative side effects we could turn around with meditation pretty quickly, and uh, 
there's lots of interesting things yet to be done and already being done. And if you joined us on a previous live stream, which is still available if you want to watch the replay, there's a use of the Memory Palace to help relieve depression and all kinds of things. So, you, and you can use it and you might want to use it, that strategy, even if you're not depressed because you never know when you might be. And you just have these inner resources where you can remember good and positive things as a way of getting yourself back on track and essentially just have a, a profound experience in life that is very, very, you have a phalanx protecting you as you move forward. And uh, if one thing knocks one shield down, well, then you've got 15 others ready to go. And uh, they can just pop into place because you've got this phalanx of skills and phalanx of powerful memories and amazing, amazing, powerful, powerful strategies for surviving. All right. So if you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And we'll carry on with some more reading skills and strategies. So Sad is here. Thanks for saying hello. Hit that thumbs up for Sad. I like that name. Uh, it reminds me of some Sanskrit that I've learned. All right. So inferring is another one. And so, you know, it's reading between the lines. And you're only going to be reading between the lines if you are able to be with the text, right? You've got to be making inferences. You've got to be thinking ahead of the author, right? Where's this going? Where's this person going? You can do that as well with a novel as you can with, um, you know, something like Maps of Meaning, which is over there. You know, where's the author taking this? Infer the direction. Infer the connections that they they themselves may be making or not making, right? And and you can even keep a going list of all this, but you want to read between the lines. What's what's not being said here, right? And where is this going? Now, if you've read the conclusion first, which I highly recommend, you probably already know this, right? And that's one reason why to read the conclusion first of scholarly books and, and history books and so forth, because that author may not actually be making all the connections they could be. And so you're dancing with the author. You're you're engaging with the author. You're tangling with the author. You're wrestling with the author. You are at one with the author when you infer, right? And you fill in the blanks and you make your own connections. You bring your own stuff. And uh you know, there you can you can think of reading or let's step back. Think of the book as an information storage and retrieval device, right? The author has downloaded some stuff into this information storage and retrieval device, and now you have the opportunity to retrieve it, right? So it's it's like sharing files in some sense. And the integrity of the transfer comes from your ability to actually compute <laughs> what's going on there, right? So let's say that the book has ideas that are kind of like a little software program that if you just run it correctly, you will then, after the pro software runs, you will see the world in a particular way, right? But you are the computer and you have to run the software. You can't blame the book. You can't blame the author. You've got to look at first the actual integrity of the inference machine that's able to actually run all the connections as you read. So you're assembling with the book more than you are with the author, but you're assembling with the author by virtue of them having been the one who wrote the software that is the book, and then you run it. And you know what? The book can be bad. There are bad books. There's no doubt about it. But nonetheless, you can fix bad books as you run them through your, 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 you know, your foundational operating system. And uh, you can defrag them in some sense by making inferences. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Books are amazing. They're, 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 they, they, they have been next level technology for a long time. And it's another reason why I just had to stop reading them on tiny screens because it's just too small. And the bigger the book, the better in some sense, because it's a larger way of imagining what's going on there. It's a larger field in which to process it. And uh, again, that's a bit of my own personal preference, but I think it, I think that some of the research we see on people struggling to comprehend what they're reading, struggling to process ideas, I think it's partly a size issue. 
I'm not sure, but that's what I, that's a thought that comes to mind. So let's see here. Reclaiming Life says, this is somewhat off topic, but relates because it is about reading. Have you read Magic is Dead yet? It's a decent book that you would probably enjoy with an interest in magic and illusion. You know, I, I, I've heard of it, um, but I haven't read it, no. And I am very interested in that, but I, I've read a review of it uh, that was in um, Genie, uh, or at least I feel that I have. I may have be creating a false memory, uh, but I certainly have come across it very recently. And uh, I'm pretty sure I read a review of it in Genie magazine. I'll have to check that. That's an interesting sensation when you're not entirely sure. Maybe you're inventing a memory. But uh, in any case, I regularly read their book reviews. Um, and yeah, magic, well, magic has always been dead and magic is always alive. But yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and look at that magazine and see if my memory is correct, that I read a review of it there or it was mentioned um, and a review may be coming. All right. So Inferring, very, very important. It's part of how you interact with the text and how you bring it to life. And you see where the author's going and you also try to fill in the blanks that they're they're not filling in. And they might fill them in later, but uh, you can uh, have a great confirmation effect where you're like, ha I knew you were going there. And that's just another part of the dance uh, with the author, which is a lot of fun. And another way to do this is compare and contrast. So when you're reading something, well, what is this like? But also, what is it not like? What is it different from, right? So that's a very powerful strategy. And so, you know, even just thinking uh, about this, I was like, well, what is this like? What other stories is it like? And what is it not like? So when I think of what it's not like, you know, something like um, Johnny Mnemonic comes to mind. It's not like that, but it's still related somehow, right? Because it has to do with memory. All right. So that's a very powerful thing. And monitoring. So what is monitoring? Well, it's actually more than um, than what it would seem. So there's a two-part sort of step here. You've got monitoring the environment to make sure that it's protected because stimulation comes in, it interacts, it distracts us. Sometimes it supplements and enhances what we're doing. But know that your body is always monitoring the environment. The, the, the level of light can change, which distracts you. The sound ambience can change. All kinds of things can change. So know that part of your mental energy is going to monitoring the environment. But more importantly, monitor yourself, right? Monitor yourself. Well, how are you reacting to the environment? And how are you reacting to the book? Like, are you having emotional reactions? And what are they? So catch yourself because sometimes you can get quite grumbly for example oh this is boring this is ridiculous i don't care about this blah 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 and if you don't really catch yourself then you're not able to stop that because it's not useful right other times you don't even catch how engaged you are but if you can catch yourself being engaged and study what engagement is like then you can start to think about how you might manufacture it manufacture it and that can be quite powerful. But you're only going to get there most likely. I mean, there may be other ways to get there. I don't know. Uh, but it seems like the most direct way to get there is to monitor yourself. And one of the best ways to monitor yourself, well, is through meditation and really understand what it is to have a conscious mind and what it, what what the limits of that conscious mind are and just how many conscious minds you, you experience and how changeable and changing they are. That will help you. And then you'll, you'll, you'll be both kinder and more patient and also more receptive to um, the things that you were already receptive to. You'll be blown away, amazed, amazed. Kioma is in the house and says, do you have any package on how to create false narratives to be able to tell stories? Thanks for asking about that. As a matter of fact, I do. Uh, I do. Uh, so I've written two books on screenplay writing, screenwriting. One is uh, horror genre secrets for screenwriters, and the other is disaster genre secrets for screenwriters. They were very well received and helped, uh, in part, kickstart my career as a story consultant. And I've always wanted to continue the series, but I never got around to it because <laughs> I sort of, 
to, to tell you the truth, being a screen uh, story consultant kind of made me uninterested in being a story consultant because, you know, I had a very good batting average and some of the things that I consulted on actually got made, which is very, very good. Uh, I had about a 20 percent. Well, actually, I had an exactly 20 percent batting average. And it's kind of cool to see things that you've uh, worked on get made. But by the same token, it uh, huh, it's just a weird industry. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about it at a different time. But anyway, I do have those books. And um, yes, uh, many people have found them beneficial. And you can read the reviews there. And uh, those books led to some interesting adventures. And I got to meet some cool actors too, and to, and on top of cool directors and screenwriters, which was a lot of fun. Um, and there's some pictures of those on my blog, uh, some of them. Uh, really, really interesting the whole movie world. So thanks for asking. And those books are on Amazon, lesser known titles in my catalog. Um, but fun, fun to read. Ernesto is here. Thanks for being here, Ernesto. And you say you're watching from Brazil. You spent this Sunday watching your videos. I believe you can't afford the course yet, but very interested in improving your memory. Excellent. Thanks for being here. And you know, when the time is right, dive in and uh, you'll be richly rewarded from all that you're doing here on the channel. And uh, in some ways, you don't need the YouTube channel to go through there, but they complement each other. And uh, we uh, are often blessed to have many Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass students here uh, in our live streams. And uh, it's just a matter of catching them <laughs> and their schedule. But uh, yeah, it works. Uh, they complement each other. But thank you for being here and thanks for your interest. And let me know anytime if you have questions. David says, I took his course a few years ago. It works. And it's David from Tennessee. Well, thanks for saying that, David. Really appreciate it. And I'm glad that it worked for you. But I got to give you the credit because you took it and uh, made it work. And uh, I'm going to mention something that you may not have seen if you did it years ago that you can dive in and benefit from because there's uh, some updates and uh, I'll be mentioning them in a minute, but if, in case you're not here, I'll let you know now. Uh, there's a visualization mastery course if you go into the exercises tab. That's where it is right now. And um, you'll find um, you'll find them there. And uh, a lot of people have been emailing and letting me know that they really, really find that course useful. It's meant as a supplement to the master plan course. And uh, supplement it, it apparently does when people put it into action. And that's the, that's the ultimate ingredient. Knowledge plus action leads to knowledge, uh, more knowledge. Knowledge of the knowledge, let's say, meta-knowledge. <laughs> In any case, thank you for uh, letting us know about that. Appreciate it. Physical says, talking about meditation and reading, did you read The Illumined Mind by John Yates Kuladasa? No, I haven't, but um, I hope to at, at some point. The Illuminated Mind. Sounds great. Omar says, I recently discovered your channel, where to get started. I don't understand many of the terms used. Thanks for asking, Omar. Um, and thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, subscribing. I hope that you have. And if you're joining us and you haven't subscribed, hit subscribe. And then go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT. That's the best place to get started. It's the thing that gets um, gets people the furthest, the fastest. And, the, and really what makes the difference is you do what's talked about there. And uh, that's the best place to get started. And then the more you actually study the materials, then the more all of this makes sense. So thanks for asking about that and uh, glad to have you here. Reclaiming Life says, knowledge plus action equals wisdom. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, there, that reminds me of, you know, this thing, you want to be a, a man of knowledge or a man of wisdom, right? And it's just obvious that wisdom is probably the better thing because the man of knowledge is is, is certain of what that person knows, whereas the person of wisdom knows just how much they don't yet know and allow that to propel them forward. And that's the ultimate finding of wisdom that, uh, that we, we need to use as part of our self-monitoring. We always need to be, it's, it's more than being humble and it's more, more than that. It's, it's just simply acknowledging the vast, vast, amount of things to know and just being so open to it and uh 
and then noticing when you're close to it so that you at least have knowledge of your own closedness. And that can help you open and change and grow as a result. And, you know, the allegory of the cave obviously comes to mind. And one thing to do is make sure you know the allegory of the cave and you know it well, which is best done in the whole context of the Republic by Plato. And then start to self-monitor your own life for how that that allegory reflects your situation and uh, the situation of others around you. That's very powerful. All right. So another reading strategy that I've always found really, really powerful is not now lists or not now folders. So you might be reading something and reading is, of course, the best thing to do. And you might go, ooh, 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 I don't know that term. I have to go and look it up. No. No, you don't. (laughs) You can just make a note of it and do it later, right? So you can clarify what it is that you don't know, and you can look it up later. This is very, very important. Because when we get back to this USSR and depth reading, if you keep interrupting yourself to look stuff up, This is going to become an endless job, a job that never ends. There's always something to look up, right? And you can just ask for your, you can just talk to yourself. Well, I don't understand this. Do I really not understand it? Or am I just looking for a, am I looking for a a, a deviation here or, or what's going on, right? And you can really, really think it through and not go and look stuff up all the time, right? So is it a, is it a thing where you need to clarify something for yourself, right? Or is it a thing where you're really just bored and you're looking for an excuse to fly from the text? Stick with the the text. Stay with the text. Just a simple note. Look up, you know? And then actually schedule some time to look things up later. Um, It could be immediately after reading. It can be the next day. It can be some other time. But don't interrupt your, your reading. It's a bad habit. It's a bad habit that makes people say, oh, it takes so long to read. Well, yeah, if you're looking things up all the time, just plow forward. So here's a little strategy. Like when I'm reading in another another language or whatever, instead of stopping for every word, I will just have a little pen. And you could do this in your mother tongue. I mean, I haven't found a book. I haven't found a word in here yet that I don't know. But instead of looking it up immediately, you could just take a little pen and put a dot. I prefer a dot as opposed to a line. And I put the little dot right here. And not right by the word necessarily, but just where where it was on the line. And uh, I'll easily find it in that line. I don't need to underline it or anything like that. Just a dot. And I I started to do this when I was first reading German because I'd be like underlining 50 words on the page. And I thought, this is not going to work. And then I broke it down to, to three words per page. And then I realized that, you know, it's just... It's not a very nice experience to go back into a book. I mean, I sometimes do underlining, but it's generally not a nice experience to underline. So I just thought, well, there's like this little kind of dot there. That's easy. That's fun to, to look at again. It doesn't make the rereading experience uh, annoying. And there's just a little dot there. So that's how I started. And then I made the rule of only three words per page. And when I would only go and look up three words per page, then soon it was one word per page that I would would need to to go and look up rather than trying to have it all. So if you would just limit it, smaller numbers, and then save looking it up for later, you'll find that you proceed a lot faster because you're using the power of small numbers. And then the next thing you know, you just read. You read. And uh, you can even make mental note of where those words were without marking the page at all. And, and go back and say, oh, yeah, there was a word there. What was it? And you fan through the pages. There it was. And then you look it up later. Um, you can get there with uh, with your reading. So that's the first thing. Do you, do you, are you just agitated and bored and you're looking for an excuse to jump away? Self-monitoring, right? Or do you need to search and deploy some sort of strategy later? And so one of those strategies can be going and making a dot and then researching based on, you know, you might read five pages and, and then you have three dots per page or whatever and you just collect them all up and then you start to 
make a list of those words. Then you go and you start to um, look them up independently. You do all of the looking up at once. Then you learn those words, memorize them, stick them in a memory palace, rack them and stack them, and then uh, go back and read that chapter again. Or just keep reading. Keep reading. So, Ernesto says, thanks, it was a warm welcome. I'm determined to take the big the plunge. Big hug. Well, big hug back at you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the hug through the airwaves, or the internet waves, whatever you call it. Appreciate that. Um, and... Uh, Claiming Life says, keeping a commonplace book variation of a journal is another option where you can write down quotes and have pages just for things, words or topics to look up later. Yeah, indeed. Um, I would just stress not interrupting yourself too much because it ends up being that the bulk of time is spent on interruptions as opposed to focus, focused reading, depth reading. All right. So moving on, self-questioning is another approach. And this has to do more with understanding. So let's say there's a concept that you don't understand and you've got to understand it, you know? Well, before you go and email the author or, uh, you know, spend all kinds of time on the internet looking it up, you can just do some self-questioning. What is it I don't understand? Try and put in your own words what it is you don't understand. And often that'll force you to actually recognize you. You're following the the plot a lot more than you think. So if you just start to say it out loud and, uh, you know, uh, well, I, I guess what I don't understand is if the universe is made out of whatever material, blah, 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 then, then, and then you find out, wait a second. Ah, that's what the dude is talking about. Yeah. Now I get it. Or, or do I, right? Like whatever. But nonetheless, you just question yourself. What is it you don't understand? Describe what you don't understand. You don't necessarily need to go and look things up. You don't necessarily need to go and write um, the author or whatever, you know? You can often figure things out. And so this is the sort of Feynman technique, but it's modified a little bit. And um, a, a very, or related to it is organized summarizing. So... One of the beautiful things to do is just have, you know, some, like something like index cards to write very brief summaries of the books that you've read, the main points, and just explain to yourself what it was that, w that was the core theme of the book. You can even have these sort of categories, core theme, main points, conclusion, and just get that all on one card. And by taking the steps to describe that to yourself, you'll understand it a lot better but you'll also remember it a lot better, even without memory techniques. And um, then organize your summaries. So when I was in graduate school doing my PhD and then my second MA, and I didn't do it as much in my first MA, though I wish that I had. I had some strategies, but nothing like what I eventually did. But, you know, like a shoebox can just, you can have a shoebox filled with index cards just for your um, summaries and have them alphabetized by the last name of the author, just like in a library. <laughs> it's very useful. You'd be surprised by just how useful it is when you're looking for something. Um, and you can do it at any stage of the game. You don't even have to be going to university in order for this to be useful. It is uh, uh, an external architecture anyone can build very, very quickly. And uh, there's many, many more powerful, powerful strategies uh, that come out of that. All right. So Chioma says... I tend to forget easily how can I start. And yes, uh, thanks for sharing that that link. Um, Reclaiming Life, that will help you. And uh, I'll just try and uh, see if I put, put in the HTTPS so it's clickable for you. Um, whoops. Dub, dub, dub. There we go. And then that's clickable for everybody. But thank you for that, William. Yeah, I'd say just start with the course. And you know, all this stuff that we're talking about today applies to this course. Um, I sometimes get these emails from people who say, well, it's too long. And I often just say, well, look, you want memory techniques so you can remember books and, and knowledge, right? 
well, long is what we deal with. That's what information is. It's long and uh, very big and spacious. And so, you know, you're looking at maybe a, an hour or something uh, total to go through this uh, program that we're sharing there on the screen. And maybe if you want to do the full Memory Palace Network, yeah, people tell me two to five hours over the course of a weekend. And uh, they're astonished when they go, it was exactly that long that it took. And uh, I go, well, yeah, I didn't make up that number. That's what people told me. <laughs> so, yeah, it's no surprise that that's how long it takes. But why, if you had something that would help you remember way more and learn way faster, how could that short period of time seem long to you when you are faced by a lifetime of vast amounts of information a billion times bigger, if not a zillion, gazillion times bigger than, than this this course, you know? So um, there is no, uh, that's, not a, that's not an objection. Let's put it that way. Gary Dean is in the house. Good to see you, Gary. It's been, a, it's been not too long of a while, but still seems uh, some distance. And you say another awesome programming, uh, or another awesome program. Yes, we're programming everybody to be better readers. Reading is a key that opens a multitude of life's locks. Memory improvement is next to godliness in the quest for self-improvement, success, and real happiness. Anthony Metivier is world class. Thank you again for all you do. Well, thanks, Gary, for your kind words. I really appreciate that. And uh, good to see you. And always uh, appreciate your enthusiasm in our mastermind group. So awesome to have you there. And uh, really, really appreciate hearing from you here today. I'm glad you could be here. All right. So if you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where in the world you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking, any questions or comments that you want to share. That would be uh, fun to go through. And now we're going to talk. We got we got more coming up here, but uh, we're going to talk about having a mnemonic association strategy. And this is this is the whole thing. You know, if you want to learn and use memory techniques, you really need to have the strategy in place as soon as possible beforehand so that you can practice it, so that you can use it with the information as it's coming in. And there's many, there's different ways to do it, but the, probably the most strategic way that makes the most sense is to get them first and then pl and practice with the information that you're using and go through things comprehensively, which is why the masterclass is the way that it is. And the other thing is that's important to understand for people is that you want to touch multiple memory disciplines so you have the strongest possible skill set. So that's another reason why it's designed the way that it is, is to encourage you to be able to deal with numbers, to be able to deal with verbatim, to be able to deal with the single words uh, one at a time. And to be able to do it based on a framework of multiple memory palaces so that you have the fullest, most robust and vibrant spatial mapping skill set or foundation that is a skill and it grows as you use it and as you practice with it. And that's a very, very important thing. So if you want the ultimate reading strategy, it's, to, it's, it's the ability, it's, it's being set up immediately as soon as possible so that you can go through all of the others and so i mentioned that i was going to uh, make a another announcement that there's a new training in the master class called visualization mastery it's on the exercises page and what this is all about is supplementing the magnetic modes so that you have more exercises to help you tap into them so that you can get sooner and faster to that level that you are um able to just encode while you're reading, make associations while you read, and run through the magnetic modes as you read. And so that's there if you, uh, and I, I know people uh, watch these replays and they have the masterclass and they say, but where is it? And uh, it's, um, it's on the exercises page and it may move. And by the way, William, those previous old uh, documents you were looking for, they're at the bottom of the FAQ page. Not sure how they wound up there, but I did do an investigation and I found them for you and I wanted to let you know. And so, uh, assuming, I mean, sometimes I get confused if it's, if it's always the same William, 
but I think that you're the same, William, and you were asking about them in uh, the Memory Dojo. And if it's a different William, then I have to try and track that down. But I think it was you. Um, and uh, that's that's where it is, on the FAQ page. All right, so if you're missing that, then um, uh, that's where that is. And these are, of course, different than the Memory Connection newsletters, but that's where they are. Okay, that was you. Great. Um, let's see here. So we're going to carry on with some more strategies, but um, after a, a short break, and Ernesto, I will elaborate on your question there when I get back, and we'll see you in just a minute. If you care to stick around, that would be awesome. I have a very special video for you as I take my little break, and uh, if you got to go, well, then thanks for being with us here today. But... Um, a break is needed, necessary, and I really appreciate seeing you and look forward to seeing you the next time. And uh, I'll be back in just a few minutes after this inspiring and positive, powerful educational demonstration of just how cool these memory techniques can be. 384626 Five zero two eight eight four one nine seven one six nine three nine nine three seven five. Hi, my name is Paul, and I've taken a few courses by Anthony Mativier, but I felt that the experience of doing it today live was the biggest advantage. Anthony has a gift in simplifying complex concepts, and I feel that I've really come away today with practical skills that I can now use effectively. Um, it was great to immerse ourselves in the situation to be able to apply the time, because when we're at home, we may not take the time to do the memory exercises that we were doing today. I felt particularly that the thing that we did at the end of today was something that is totally unique in memory training, which is three days of memory, which is how to practice your skills. Um, I've read many memory books and I've never come across a system laid out as to how to practice what you've learned. And this is what I gained today from Anthony's course. So I, I give a 10 out of 10. <laughs> Thank you. Five, three, four, two. One one seven zero <laughs> six seven nine. <laughs> <laughs> now we're back. Thanks for letting me know about that, Adonis. Um, I think now we should have audio back. Really uh, <laughs> apologize for that. Um, what I was saying is we're back, and now we're going to get to Ernesto's uh, uh, question and Maricella's comment before we carry on. But uh, if the audio is not back, let me know. It should be back. Um, well... I don't know. Uh, I'll wait until... Okay, so Adonis says, yes, it's working. Great. Apologies for that. <laughs> oh, you have no idea how many bizarre tools are all playing at once uh, when, when we do these live streams. There's even more at work than some of the videos. All in good fun. Thank you for your patience. 
and and I appreciate you letting me know because who knows how long I would have gone on without knowing. Um, <clears throat> all right, so as I was saying, I'm gonna get catch up with Ernesto's question and uh, Maricela's comment. So Ernesto, um, and thanks for letting me know that the audio is fine. Maybe you can tell me more about what is your specific question about. Um, rather than just elaborating wildly, do you have a specific question about it? Because uh, it sounds like you already have knowledge of it. So um, we might as well just, you know, cut to the chase and see if there's a more specific question. And uh, Maricella says, now when I go to any class, I do not, I, do, I see no students reading and using strategies. I asked them, they said it's boring. Well, um, ask them what's so boring about it. I would be very curious about how that they, how they, um, how they uh, translate that, how they would elaborate on that, to use um, the word in uh, Ernesto's question. The, the the reality is, is that, you know, I've thought a lot about how to actually make change in this area. And at some level, one of the strategies is just to let people be as they are and uh, try to find the people who are as excited as you are uh, and understand the 80-20 rule. This is going to be that way, uh, it seems. And do we really want a world in which we come up with all sorts of external devices to try and change that? I know uh, from my own experience that it was very uncomfortable with certain uh, instructors where they would just really be nasty with people who didn't participate and they just made it uncomfortable for even the people who did want to participate um and likewise you know you can just offer people strategies you can talk about why they're not using them you can get more curious about why they're bored but you need a little bit of uh, critical distance from it at the end of the day because you can find people who are excited and that's one of the things we're doing here today and uh it it it, it is by some strange design, a small group of people, I don't know why, I sort of stopped banging my head against the wall trying to figure out why, and just do the best that one can to engage those who are ready, willing, and able to, uh, to engage. And so that's, uh, that's what we, we can do. And then other people will be, so to speak, magnetically attracted to that if, uh, if you are yourself more active in the groups that do exist and the contexts that do exist where people are excited about these things. That's at least what I, my finding is, but I'm not into uh, any anything that, that really would, um, I don't know, in somehow, in some way berate students for not um, being part of... Uh, a participating group. It just seems to be a natural law of, of reality. The 80-20 rule. All right. So Ernesto has one memory palace for now. It's my apartment. I wonder if I could reuse it. Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, if you want to reuse memory palaces, I would suggest you do that after you have more than one. It's not the real skill uh, at the end of the day. The real skill is working with multiple memory palaces. Alex Mullen has talked about, you know, not really prefer, preferring not to have any strategies around reusing memory palaces. You can listen in on, uh, he and I, we don't really discuss that on our podcast, but he has it on his blog. Idris Zogai and I, we talk more about it on, um, on the podcast episode and, uh, you can dive into that. Um, but I, I really in good, in, in good faith for the best possible outcome for you, can't really, you know, think of diving in deep into reusing memory palaces when one is not, is not the space at which one uh, has, has the problem uh, of needing to, or really maxed out the skill itself in order to, to fully even use the one that you have already to its maximum capacity and ability. So, a parallel thing would be like, let's say you go to a gym and uh, a person, a trainer there 
tries to get you to lift 450 pounds, bench press 450 pounds, when you have joint pain and you haven't even started to do enough flexibility, you know, and you're not even doing the bar without weights on it, you know, because you can't. What you, what you do is you build the foundation, the core. You build your core. You build all the, all the other muscles involved in there. And then you, then you move into that sort of area. So um, Reclaiming Life has some, some advice for you there. But my advice would be dive into, uh, dive into having more memory palaces first as just, a, just the most powerful strategy. If you just want to reuse memory palaces, then go ahead and get a deck of cards and just start reusing it. Forget about strategy and just reuse them. And then you'll discover all kinds of things just from that. If you want to add colors, well, you already know that that exists. So add some colors, see what happens. But don't make it a, a, a replacement for making and using more memory palaces. It's the wrong uh, approach uh, for most people. Maybe not for you. Uh, I really can't judge at the end of the day. But the, the um, most realistic thing to really get spatial memory working for you is multiple memory palaces used and really explored. And then start to refine that original one if you want to go and reuse it. But this also raises the topic that needs to come up again and again and again because people don't um, either understand it for whatever reason or, or they don't come across it for whatever reason, is that the memory palace is itself a tool of reuse at some fundamental level so that the information goes into long-term memory. Whereas some people come to it as something they're going to put information in there and it's going to stay forever. No, no, and a thousand times no. That's not what it's for. It's a tool for getting the information into long-term memory. And what happens to the palace after that is up to you. You can reuse it, but all the more reason to have multiple memory palaces. So you have multiple tools to do what the memory palace is supposed to do. It's not an internal uh, storage thing. That's called a book, <laughs> you know, uh, this storage and retrieval device. No, you want the memory palace to make your brain the storage and retrieval device through this technique in order that you just have the information, right? So... It's um, it's a it's a way of thinking about the tool that that often needs to change. I don't know if that's the case in in your situation, but um, often that's why people want to reuse memory palaces, and that's just that's um, not the skill in my view, and not the skill in the view of others as well. So um, it's not not my own uh, it's not my own opinion. It's also partly just the science that underlies all of this and how that you really are most likely to grow your skill and how, and, and, and pretty much exactly what you would be told by, uh, by any memory trainer, uh, worth their duff. So Pai is my love had asked, what is the 80, 20 rule? You say you also don't enjoy reading at all. And I really want to change that habit and find some joy in it. Okay. So 80, 20 rule. I mean, it's called Peretu's principle, the Peretu principle or Price's law. There's different words for it. Um, and it means different things in different contexts and so on and so on. Uh, so you, it's not like we're just going to have like this one meaning for it. But generally, it is meaning that you're going to get, you know, the majority of the results from a very, very small amount of activity. So in some contexts, if you... Um, if you have uh, a business with 50 employees, probably the most results, the most productivity is going to come from five of them. It's, all, it's also related to the rule of redundancy in many ways. Um, so that's a, the, the, like, for example, um, most of a text is redundant. This, this book, I could tell you what happens in here in two sentences. The, the vast, the, all the sentences and the words and many of the words are like so many of the words are and, the, but, and so on, right? It's just redundance. It's just this massive redundancy. But you need all of the redundancy in order for the 20%, let's say, to produce the meaning, right? 
to produce the meaning. So that's another sort of sense of what 80-20 rule means. Um, so let me know if you have more questions about that, but that's basically what it is. In terms of changing, you know, making it that you enjoy reading, what is it that you don't enjoy about it? Let's start there and try and describe and see what it is that you don't enjoy about it. Um, so Reclaiming Life said to Ernesto, I personally find that the best way for me at least is to use different stations on the Mary Palace walkthrough using furniture for one, walls and corners for another. Um, and Pai is my love says... Uh, I've never understood how people use the corners of a memory palace. Wouldn't the walls of the palace be more significant, having more surface area for your visual representation to be represented? And Reclaiming Life says they are equal to each other if you find a way to attach the image to the location. Yeah, it's an interesting question, actually. And I would say take those questions and apply them to your practice. Find out. <laughs> find out. Because what Reclaiming Life is saying is, is I would say, absolutely correct. They are equal. But I say they're more than equal. They're, they they have powers that can be used differently. Corners can be used in a way that is slightly different, um, but at the end of the day, is equal at the end of the day. Um, and it, it will depend on your strategies, your style, and um, how you develop as you use them. And so... Just dive in. Let let the practice be the the way that you um, the way that you do the, the way that you develop and answer those questions. Okay, so Maricella says I enjoy too much reading books, but I need to set a time and place to do that. If I find people who like the same topics, I meet in a public place to read it. Amazing, that's cool. Yeah, like group reading is pretty fun. And you say you like using your imagination while reading a book and draw the scenarios, the people, the objects, the author is describing in the book. Maricella, you're an amazing artist, so that's cool. Um, and yeah, it's a great way to make it more imaginative. So Hockey says in art, 80-20 is 80% is structure, 20% is detail. However, that 20% takes 80% of the time. Right, yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it as well. Um, and... We might, I don't know if that totally applies to Memory Palace, but I think I think in a way too, but it's just that it's not going to take that long, right? You could, the, I don't know how long uh, the Memory Palace we saw today from Patricia took, but uh, this is like two two minutes, probably probably less. I didn't time it, but let's just be liberal and say it was like two minutes. And uh, so I don't know if the 80-20 rule falls there, but because certainly... Like 99.9% .9 of my time is going to be in the memory palace after that I have um, drawn it. But the point is, is there's still a distribution there. And it's interesting and powerful to think about that distribution. And so it, even, you know, if someone uh, is not, um, not enjoying reading, you could think about, you know, how could you use this and... Uh, maybe do some of that reading in a particular time and in a particular location where there's something much less enjoyable going on. And then, it, then the, the, the reading is actually an escape from that and much more pleasurable. Uh, maybe, maybe a little strategy to think about. All right. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. We're going to carry on with some more reading strategies, but feel free to pop in your comments, your questions, your points of view, your experiences. And uh, if you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing. If you're not subscribed to this channel, get subscribed. And if you're watching the replay, feel free to leave a comment below. I always appreciate hearing from the replay viewers. And um, I've asked some questions and gotten some interesting answers. And that's always a lot of fun. All right. So, well, let's catch up with Pi is my love before we... Um, dive into the rest here. I do not know why I don't enjoy reading. My hunch is the lack of visualization plays a part in it. I honestly don't know. I also find more joy in playing video games than reading too. Okay, so um, uh, read Ready Player One. That's a book about video games and see if you can um, 
find that your passion uh, for video games becomes uh, a little bit more transferred over to reading. And just read a page at a time. See if you can just get through a page and then see if that works, if you can... Well, in that case, in that book, if you can stop yourself after reading the first page, that would be amazing because it's a really good novel. But, um, you know, if you don't find that experience, just see if you can get through a page, see what happens, then give yourself a break. Then try two pages. Once that you're okay getting through a page, then try three. Just see if you can build up to USSR. And um, just start with your interest. So you're interested in video games? Well, Ready Player One is not only an amazing novel, but it's all about video games. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I was going to say I can't recommend it, but actually I think I can because it was actually strangely good. So there's a, um, but it was a long time ago. So don't, don't shoot me if, uh, <laughs> if it turns out that it was, it was bad. But when I did my first MA and I wrote about novelizations, there's actually a novelization of Tron. So you you like video games? Go watch Tron. Read the novelization. It's really weird. And Existence too. Existence has a really interesting novelization. And uh, you know if you if you if you really get good at reading, you could look up my first master's thesis and read what I wrote about novelization. And then you'd be like, okay, so I actually went and read Tron, and I I read Existence, and now I can read what old Dr. Metivier had to say about these bizarre novelizations that are about video games. So Existence is about a video game. And if you find that you like the movie, well, then you could do it. Uh, you could read the novelization just to see what the heck they did in there because it's bizarre. Uh, it's strange and fun. And uh, then what's happening in your mind is you're comparing and contrasting, which is what we said is a great reading strategy, right? Same thing with Ready Player One. I mean, you can go watch the movie. I didn't really like the movie. I don't know why exactly I didn't like the movie. It's typical Spielberg with his concerns, but I wasn't really, I wasn't, it just didn't, it just didn't jam with me. It didn't gel. I don't know why. Um, but I really liked the novel. But as you're watching, right, you're comparing and contrasting. And if I go back and read it, then I would compare and contrast both my first read with my second read, and I would compare and contrast it with the film, which is a reading strategy and a strategy for developing your interest, which is very, very powerful. And Ernesto says, got it, walk before you run. Understand mind palaces as a traditional tool which are used to convey info from short to eventually long-term memory. Thanks, Dr. Mittivier. Well, thank you. Thank you. And Reclaiming Life says interactive fiction games, things like Zork, but they come in all genres. Maybe a good segue for people who like video games but don't enjoy reading books very much. Yeah, that 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 can be. I would just say um, it, it, here in this case, the interaction that is being sought after in games is um, maybe going to be found in interactive fiction games. But then get a choose-your-own-adventure. When I say read, I mean go away from machines. Leave the machines. Go to the park. Go to a cafe with no devices, nothing to interrupt you, so that the only thing to do is read, right? And uh, enjoy that isolated, protected space so it's not interrupted, you know? Um, I said, like It's the same thing for me with music. I'm now on a Bach mission again, and, uh, you know, I have to... I have uh, I have to either print out the music or I have to read it from a computer that that is not going to be bombarded with all kinds of interesting things on there. It's got to be focused on the music, right? Uh, and that's really really important. So remove yourself from the interruptions and distractions. I think you'll have a, a great uh, great time. Get a real book, a physical book. It actually matters. I don't have my copy of Ready Player One in this room. Otherwise, I'd show it to you. But I really like that book, and I, I think you'll like it as well. Um, so you're going to give it a shot. And you're not sure about Thrawn as you do not enjoy Star Wars. Yeah, I'm not um, I'm not entirely sure um, that I enjoy Star Wars either. But it is a good case study in the hero's journey. 
All right, so SDFG is in the house. Dopamine hits from video games. What is released when we read in depth? That's a good question. You know, I'll, 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 I really don't know uh, what is released when we read in depth. But if we have reading as a habit, then some of those chemicals would likely be dopamine and myelin. And uh, some opioid receptors would be in there, provided that it's a positive habit for us. And, you know, I, I have throughout the day this longing to just go and read. And that must be because of brain chemical um, brain chemical associations that that are so tightly knit that it's like the gym. Like I just, I, if I don't go to the gym and I skip a day, it's like I have to go to the gym. I don't even want to go to the gym, but my body has to go. Must be a brain chemistry thing, right? Same thing with reading. If, I, if I'm not reading, I start to crave it and I need to go and I need to go and read. So this is um, very, very important. So Reclaiming Life says, for choose your own adventure books, but for adults, you could look into something like the Fabled Land series, a cross between a solo RPG and choose your own adventure book. Well, thanks for mentioning that. I was looking at some choose your own adventure books, actually, and I was like, yeah, this is for kids. I probably wouldn't have that fun. And I was, I, I just didn't think to, 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 to think if there were adult versions, um, which makes me wonder. Maybe I should write ones that are not fantasy, but somehow... Oh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Anyway, <laughs> anybody see Bandersnatch? That was quite a interesting choose your own adventure. Um, all right, Pie is my love. We'll try to read it at a library. Awesome, thumbs up to that. If you haven't hit the thumbs up yet, do so now and let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And Hockey is asking, could an audio book be a bridge to reading written books? Certainly. You know, when I was de in my deepest depression, I uh, found as many audio books as I could and even just made my own. And, you know, an example, I had to read uh, White Noise by Zadie Smith. Is that right? I think so. Um, and it's a big novel. And I had to read it not just for my own research, but I had to read it for teaching because I was teaching uh, I was the TA of a course and we had that novel on on the books and I'm just that kind of diligent dude that no matter what's going on I'm going to read before I show up to the tutorial and teach people stuff and uh what I did is I just and I did this a lot is I just read along with the audiobook so I found the audiobook of it and I read along uh with the book what happens sometimes is that the audiobook will be different than the edition that you have. So, for example, you might get an audiobook that's from Britain and you're reading an American edition of the book and they will change certain things uh, for a British or, a, you know, whatever, a British audience or an American audience or whatever it may be. That can be weird. Sometimes there'll be expurgations. So you might want to look for that it's a, that it's unabridged, uh, an audiobook that's unabridged and uh uh, the novel is also unabridged. I remember reading, it was actually very good. It was well performed, but I remember reading, uh, for the second time, Crime and Punishment along with an audiobook, and the audiobook was, was abridged and I had to keep flipping through and like finding where the dude was jumping to on the narration. But, uh, nonetheless, it was a good narration and they, they actually abridged it quite well. Luckily I'd read it before. So I sort of could fill in the gaps, but, um, anyway, interesting experience. The point being is that I read while listening and I had the physical book and I would, you know, sometimes my, my, um, concentration was shot so bad, but I knew I needed to train it. I would just put on a timer and like, I didn't want to read it. I, I, I had no interest in reading it personally. I just, it was my job. I had to know it and I had to know it well. And I had to make observations about it. I had to do a lot of the things we've been talking about today in terms of monitoring myself, comparing, contrasting, reading between the lines, thinking about where the author's going, connecting it to all kinds of different ideas like when was it written and what were the things going on in the world and who are some of the other authors that write this way and making this massive web in my head. 
And, and this is just the reality of life. You sometimes need to do things for your profession uh, that you don't personally want to do. And how are you going to do it? Well, set a timer and sit there and get through it. And on top of that, to stop my mind wandering, I would also, you know, this whole thing about stopping your sub vocalization, I would also try to actually speak it along there when my concentration was really, really slipping. Now, I don't hear things in my head. I, I, don't, I don't really hear my voice in my head, but you can also just move your mouth. I remember I used to see my mom. She would read and she, her mouth is just moving all the time. I don't know why. Maybe she doesn't hear anything in her head either. But um, the the whole thing is, is you don't have to hear things in your head in order to actually f- craft your focus and concentration by actually moving things or just going through the motions as if you could hear something in your head. So lots and lots of strategies for focus. And, you know, you don't have to use them all the time. You can just use them when you're not focused. And often what you'll find is, oh, now I'm a little bit more focused. So timing, reading along with it, having an audio and reading along with the audio, either if you can mentally recreate it in your mind along with that person, um, or uh, actually just manually moving your mouth can be a great strategy. All right, so Ars Combinatoria. Now, this is an interesting thing that can help you remember more and focus more. And we're not going to go into all of Ars Combinatoria, but I'm working out a whole course based on what the things that, you know, I already sort of have this in a, in a different program, uh, but building it out for memory more. And what we what we can do as we read is really focus on certain things and amplify them in comb- combinations. So things like weight, thinking about how much things weigh, how big they are, their size, um, what their width is, what distances are, distances both physically and distances in time. These are mental tools that you bring out and you just consider as you're reading along. So I don't have any particular example in mind, but I've already read this page. And so do you notice any heart palpitations? My heart was pounding, but that was after I became confused, more like an adrenaline response to being scared. I remember feeling really great, actually just before it happened. So heart, imagining the heart, how big is it, right? And I'm thinking, how big would this character's heart be, right? And then how much would it weigh? And heart pounding and adrenaline, she's mentioning these things. So getting an image of like, well, how far does adrenaline have to shoot through the body? And it's not like really an image. I don't really see anything as such, but just beginning to visualize these systems, so to speak, and think of the systems and how long they are through the body. That's just a quick example. And as you're reading, you're just connecting with the text. You're just thinking about things like weight, size, distance, and and so on. There, there, there's more to it than that, but that's something that you can do. Um, I don't know how we would do this necessarily with a Sanskrit grammar guide here, but... Um, yeah, I'm not even going to try there, but because it doesn't, it, it it seems to be more on things that have to do with with facts or maybe plot things or narrative characteristics of the body and so forth. But maybe we can try. What the heck? The worst thing that can happen is that it doesn't work. So many of the relationships that English normally expresses by means of word order, subject, verb, verb, object, etc., are expressed in Sanskrit by means of inflections. Durlabham, uh, apelashati, manoratha. Okay, so, you know, relationships. So I can, so many of the relationships that English normally expresses by means of word order. um, So he's now saying subject, verb, verb, object. I can actually stop and like think of a sentence that's subject, verb. And I can also think in my mind, like what is the length of a normal sentence? Things like that. Now, I don't know how useful that will be or valuable that will be in that context. Probably not that valuable, but it is something that you could do if your concentration is slipping and you're not focusing. It's just like get an idea in your mind of the length of sentences, how sentences are ordered, maybe picture what's actually being talked about there and think about it. Because I'll have to tell you, this is one of the most challenging books that I've ever gone through. And um, uh, I'm still going through it. And it's very, very interesting, but challenging. 
Uh, and so I haven't been using this technique, but now I think I will actually explore it more for this kind of text. In any case, um, it's just a strategy. It can help with your focus, but it can also help you remember more because you're just naturally focused on it. And now, now probably I won't be able to shake that scene. As I looked at it again, I was like, I remember that, but I didn't distinctly remember it. Uh, but now I probably will more distinctly remember it because I've gone through those things. Oh yeah, how, you know, it's just a weird thing, right? But it, it actually brings more dimension to it. All right, so we'll check in with our chat, but let's just quickly go through critical thinking skills as a reading strategy. You know, we had a whole live stream all about that, and you can go through that. But, um, you know, it's 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 kind of related to what we talked about before with reading between the lines and inferring things. But you also can think of critical thinking in terms of compare and contrast. And also just like, what is your opinion of this? What is your, not so much your opinion, but what is your thesis on this? What is your uh, antithesis? And what is your synthesis as you go along? So where are you in agreement? Where do you converge, as they say, with the text? Where do you diverge? Or like where where are you not in agreement with what you're reading and why? What's the history? What's the genealogy behind this? What because every opinion that you have will have a history. It'll have a story. Every finding you have. And then the ultimate critical thinking thing is what's the evidence, right? Where is the evidence going on in this? And uh, that's the best thing to do, is to have a, an empirical mindset as you're reading and just saying, like, how is this author being empirical? Where are they not being empirical? Is empiricism necessary here? Uh, you know, that sort of thing, because you don't always have to have the, <laughs> the hammer of science all over everything, right? Um, and sometimes it's not useful to, to do so. But it is useful to notice when it's not useful to do so because you're thinking scientifically, you're looking for evidence, you're looking for also your own biases. So we all have them. And so one of the best things you can do to develop your critical thinking skills is to understand what cognitive biases are, understand what yours are, understand the ones that you might develop, uh, both positively and negatively, and work on removing or lessening their impact and you can practice that while reading. And um, Mahesh is here. Thanks for saying hello and your question. How to stop procrastination? Well, one of the ways is exactly our next point. Thanks for asking that, which is to plan and schedule rest. And so um, rest is something that is very, very important to take breaks. And if you strategize your breaks, then you're much more likely to take them. And while you're taking breaks, all kinds of cool things can happen. So your mind gets a little bit more diffuse, thoughts percolate through, and you can reward yourself by actually taking a, a break on a schedule and know that you're not taking a break. If you're a carrot stick kind of person, that can really work. If you're not, you got to think of other things. But having scheduled rest as a reward for focusing can help you. Um, and in terms of procrastination as well, I mean, do an analysis through journaling and see just how much you're, you're actually transcribing. Uh, sorry, transcribing. <laughs> Where is my mind? Um, how much you're procrastinating. You may not be procrastinating as much as you think. You may be launching a huge negative architecture against yourself that uh, doesn't stand a reason because you have a sensitivity to it, and so you may have exaggerated it, that's something to be considered. Uh, that's certainly what I have found, is that I don't procrastinate enough. You know, I'm just like, go, 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 oh, got to do this, got to do that. You know, this is more like I have to schedule in rest. I actually have to practice rest because I get bored very, very quickly if I'm not doing something, uh, you know. And so uh, one, of the, one of the cool things, if you read uh, Alex Pang's rest book, he talks about how, Actually, you can get a lot of rest by taking your skill set and applying it to something else that has a different outcome or perhaps just the outcome of, uh, of not working, right? So I started writing fiction again a little bit uh, simply because I can't stop writing. And so I, uh, you know, take a rest from the, from the writing, writing to just play around on some fiction that I just don't care if it ever gets made uh, and just, you know, work through the rules of fiction uh, as a fun sort of thing or the constraints and, uh, and just, just 
It's like dabbling with paint. You know, no one's going to look at the painting and just rest, but still do, you know, and it's, it's, it's helped a lot. Uh, so that's uh, one way to do it. But rest is a, is a huge thing for stopping procrastination and just getting more ideas. I hope that helps you out. Um, but yeah, study yourself and make a plan to rest. Strategize your rest. Now, moving on, we'll talk about strategic reflection. And this can happen while you're resting, but really not enough people do this. They, they actually need to make time to percolate. You actually schedule percolation. And um, you, can, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can do it just by yourself and say, I'm going to go take a walk. And I'm going to, on this walk, actually think about what I just read. Not random stuff, but actually think about it. And one of the ways that, uh, that that you do that is just start doing it and see what happens. It can be a bit of a challenge. Your mind can wander, but just practice bringing it back. You can make a little to-do list in a little journal. And uh, these are the things you're going to think about. And just go and make notes. This is usually how I do it. It's like I've read something or had a meeting or whatever. Just go grab this, go out, reflect on it, and just make notes. Brain dump out a bunch of stuff and see what happens. And it's very, very powerful. But it's time for reflecting and letting the dots connect. Also, I'll doodle a little bit. I love to doodle um, and draw and stuff like that just to allow thoughts to, to occur and insights to come. But you got to time it. you got to actually make time for it. And then strategic rereading. So in the link below, I have a link to a podcast on the 11 reasons why you should reread books. And it's very, very important to reread things. Don't have to read them in whole all the time, but it's, it's something that allows you to confirm what you understood, to brush up on the things that you didn't understand so that you know, you, you have the fullest, plumpest, most robust idea of what's going on in your mind when you get there. So lots of books, like one book that I have scheduled here. I use a little pile to like schedule rereading. It's three down is Mind Map Mastery. I understand it. I get it. I wrote a whole review about it and um, I need to reread it. I need to reread it not only because it was already there, but now I even want to put it higher on the pile. I won't because I have a little rereading schedule, but um, now it seems even more pertinent because of, of the passing of Tony Buzan. But um, in any case, have a strategy for rereading and that's what we talk about. So you can follow, find out more, follow the link in the description below on the rereading strategy. And then the ultimate reading strategy is to teach others to teach others. So we've talked about making summaries, which is part of the levels of processing. We've talked about talking out loud while you're reading, which is part of this. We've talked about all kinds of things, reflecting in your mind, which is part of the levels of processing. But the level of processing that really binds them all is opening your mouth and talking to somebody else. And if you don't have somebody else to talk to, it's better to just talk in the shower but to get it out of your own mouth in a finalized sort of form. So shower lectures are great. And uh, it freaks my wife out sometimes, but she'll like, I'll come out of a room and I'll be just be like, blah, 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 blah. But I just do, I just talk out loud to these things that I've discovered and explore and connect the dots through verbalizing, giving these little mini lectures. It may uh, be that I'm just trained to do so because long before these YouTube lives showed up, I was lecturing at least once a week at the university. And uh, I would often write these lectures in my head and walk around the house. I'd just be going here and I'd be saying, blah, 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 blah. But it's, it's, it's essentially teaching phantom people. But even better is actually teaching others. And so how are you going to do this? Well, you can get study groups together, right? It, it, it's so, so easy. Almost everybody can do this somehow, some way. It can be a discussion group. While Facebook is still around, you could use that if you want. I, I had various levels of success in doing that, and it, it can be quite good, um, especially if you use the Kill Newsfeed app, which I highly recommend. Um, uh, you can use meetup.com to find other people uh, to meet with in 
in public. You can have reading challenges with people like, hey, we're both going to read this book and have a discussion and uh, share your findings and so on. There's, there, there's lots and lots of things, but those will be some strategies for you. Gary says, I know of no really successful people who aren't avid readers. One of the best gifts gifts I have I ever gave my three children was the love of reading. All three children are now very successful adults, have bachelor and master's degrees in fields they love. Awesome, Gary. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. It helps everybody in the world. And and you're right. There's there is a strong correlation between reading and success. And I would also say there's a strong correlation between reading and fulfillment and having mental survival tools that we all need and that we all are called upon to have in various ways in life. And so, you know, one of the things that you can do, especially when you reflect, when you reflect on what you've read, even if you're just primarily into fiction, fiction has a lot of philosophy in it. There's a lot of tools in there. And if you reflect on what you've read, then you can draw upon those things, you know, how to live life according to Shakespeare, you know, or how not to live life according to Shakespeare. Maybe those are two books that are just, um, I think there's books like that that already exist, but those are two titles that that uh, potentially should come out. Uh, in all cases, um, reading is a survival, it's a survival tool. It's become one, and it's part of why that humanity has grown to what it has grown. And it's amazing. So please read. If you don't already, find a way to read. And uh, speaking of reading, I thank everybody again for snapping up the remaining copies of this. Pretty sure if memory serves, Gary's got one. Um, and uh, so there's going to be, I'm, I've got to actually put a timer now on the thing because we're getting down to, to uh, the last half of the last box. And so if you don't have one and you want to get one and join, people who read together, then make sure to go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash TMC for the memory connection. And there's a little bit of light promotion going on to that, which is all that was needed to get down to the last copies. So um, I gave all the YouTube people fair warning on that. And then I went to the email list. And so now we're getting down to the end. So this is pretty much the last call. Make sure that you get one if you want one. All right. So with all that said, let's get into some some chat and um, got some comments here. I got to catch up on one I remember seeing and some new ones. And uh, I'll just get you that link in case you want one of these. hope I typed that correctly. Couldn't quite see. Yeah, should be right. <clears throat> All right. So, Reclaiming Life said, I used to listen to audiobooks more when doing brainless tasks as a way of making them more enjoyable, but I've realized reading on its own is better. So now I listen to podcasts at those times. Very good, yeah. Um, I would I would agree. I mean, I, I haven't been listening to audiobooks very much for the longest time. I think audiobooks... They tend to create the illusion that your mind is not wandering, even when it is. And uh, this is um, this is a fairly powerful um, conclusion that I had for my own life. And so I went back to reading. And even Kindle, you know, I just can't, I can't do it. The odd time I'll look into one, um, but I just don't even like to have uh, have them on my machine uh have that app so reclaiming life says how to live according to dr zeus can't stress enough how much people should reread his books as an adult indeed indeed yeah that's a good point he's uh he's genius uh I'll, I'll share you my favorite of his which you should get if you don't have it already um Oh. oh man, I was deadlifting this morning and I'm just broken machine. <laughs> but uh, this is my favorite, Dr. Zeus. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, I can read red, I can read in blue, I can read in pickle color too. 
I can read in bed and in purple and in brown. I can read in a circle and upside down. I can read with my left eye. I can read with my right. I can read Mississippi with my eyes shut type, shut tight. <laughs> so amazing. Um, but also who I really like from the world of children, Roald Dahl. Uh, he's got some fun facts and jokes here in this book. <laughs> so amazing. The first Christmas cracker was pulled in 1846, he says. So, you know, that's kind of like a cool opportunity to use the memory techniques. I know we don't normally think of Roald Dahl this way, but, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is amazing. Um, so many great uh, things there. I'm trying to find a joke here. One of these jokes in here. So funny. Um, and there's like this little true and false stuff. What do you say to Mr. Twit when he has stale bread, baked beans, and smelly sardines poking out of his ears? <laughs> Anything you like, he can't hear you. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Um, Mahesh asks, Sir, how to reflect properly and technique. Okay, let's talk about reflection, proper reflection. And uh, Pi is my love asks, Anthony, how have you been? Well, well, thank you for asking. I've been just fine. Um quite a quite a lot of things going on all at once uh thank you for asking uh, why are you worried <laughs> um yeah i'm i'm now going through the edit that i've received back of the next book and yeah it, it needs even more work <laughs> basically um so i need to um i need to to go through it very very intensively and make sure that it's going to meet its goals. And, uh, but it's good enough now to show some, some publishers and agents. And I'm still not sure I'm going to go that route, but somehow I wound up uh, sending some, a book, creating a book proposal and sending it to some publishers and agents. And it just appeared. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it too much. And then all of a sudden there was a proposal and some emails sent. And we'll see. Uh, if they get back to me before that I publish it, then we'll see what they say, if they want to read it or not, and have an option on it. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Uh, what else? Yeah, just developing new courses and um, updating old ones and doing doing what I do and uh, enjoying the ride. And yeah, in terms of, you know, I do, I do um, card practice again, near daily that's been a lot of fun um exploring that getting back into that uh it's been a while since i memorized cards like maybe two months or something i took a break but nonetheless it it feels like an event every time you get back into it uh so that's cool and yeah just just stuff is going on and it's great meditating sort of not taking a break from memorizing sanskrit but taking a break from it, so to speak, but still I haven't missed a day yet of doing my recitation and it gets longer. Uh, so that's a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, just watching movies and stuff and hanging out and, uh, Oh, and I've been learning Bach again, which is great. Um, and I, I'm sort of doing this structure now. I mean, I've done it before, but getting back into it, which is learning three kinds of song at the same time. So like something that's really, really beginner, easy, <laughs> yawn, snore, snore kind of music to play and something intermediate and then something really, really complicated <laughs> at the same time. And why would you do this? Why would you start, um, like, why would you even have something boring in the mix? Well, it's because it's not really boring, but like part of my bass style and my interest in bass guitar with this elaborate stuff and, you know, pretty much progressive metal and stuff is because I just get bored with but it's still worth it as a bassist to practice that kind of music so you can lock in with the drums and so you can lock in even with the guitar at times and you know think of the role of bass in music but especially locking in with the drums and really really having proper accentuation and focus because it's actually it's very difficult for me to focus on 
three chord music where the bass is just basically dun 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 I get lost. It's the hardest music actually, even though it's the simplest, because I'm just like, I mean, I remember even just playing ACDC for whatever reason, sometimes the the last band I was in, they just like to do a couple of cover tunes once in a while. And I was just like, oh man, couldn't we pick some cover tunes that at least there's something to do in the music? We did Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses, which is pretty active. That was good. But um, yeah, even even some Megadeth songs that we, we'd play, like uh, Symphony of Destruction, it's just a kind of boring song on bass. Like, it's just nothing to do. Um, whereas the music of the band was just like, oh man, you can hardly keep up. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Um, but in any case, intermediate for me is like the box stuff. And then I'm doing some dream theater and, uh, oh man, that's there. It's not only a combination of really mechanically difficult stuff in terms of hands, but also the timing because they switch time, uh, signatures all the time. And so you've got to have the hands in the right place at the right time when the time is changing. It's just like the signature is changing. It's really bizarre. Anyway, I like to like focus on those three kinds of things and just pay them their due, get them down, polish them. And then you have other things that you have to obey. Like I have a bad habit of raising my shoulder a fair amount on this side. Um, and I just pay attention to the body and just catch myself and put it back down. And, uh, uh, Sergio, who was the guitarist in my last band, he had the great lesson for me, which is just to like, cement the arm in place on the actual instrument but um yeah anyway music is just a great ongoing challenge and it's it's especially a challenge because every instrument you play poses its own challenges anyway um pies my love says your life sounds really awesome and action-packed yeah yeah as all are all all lives aren't they uh awesome and action-packed i hope so I never would have thought the bass would be hard to focus on. Yeah, it, it is. Well, for me, the, the those those songs are um, are hard to focus on, but um, it is it's it's a challenging instrument, and it's it's not always used as as uh, as the sophisticated instrument and texture in music that it could be, which is. Uh, just fine. <laughs> but in any case, I love the bass. I've always been into the bass. All right, so we, we were going to talk about how to reflect properly and technique. Okay, so Mahesh, uh, let me know if you have more specific questions on that. Like, what is reflection? What does it mean to reflect? Well, part of it is that you actually deliberately reflect as a thing. So that means you have a definition for it. And for me, that definition is to spend some time thinking and often reflection is in the form of writing and thinking about writing and thinking about what I'm going to write in advance of writing it and then reflection is testing the validity of the thoughts so is it true and how do I know how if I don't know how could it be known what would be the steps to make it known so you know I often catch myself being against this or that memory palace approach or whatever. So I catch myself. Well, how do I know? Actually, we did a live stream and I was like, yeah, okay. Um, let's, uh, let's try this. And I came up with this memory palace and I was like, how do I know now that I've created it? How do I know it's actually not going to work? Right? So I go out and try it. That's part of what reflection does. It, reflection helps you actually catch yourself in your own BS and stop yourself. And then, actually go and then how would I know right and so it doesn't have to be memory it could be something else like for example uh, I don't have an academic book here really but let's just say I did I had something scholarly uh, or a, top, a history book or whatever and say well I don't agree with that well I why don't I agree with it reflect on it and think about the um, the history that might be involved in there and then if, if, you, if I don't agree with it, what would I do to confirm that my disagreement is valid? Likewise, and just as important, hey, I really agree with that, is to stop and reflect. Why do I agree with that? 
What's the history behind my coming to this moment where I agree with this? And how would I confirm that my agreement with this is actually solid, that it actually makes sense, that it's actually worth having? How would I know this? Well, there's lots of tools for how you would know it. And we've talked about some of them. Like if you've looked at the index of the book, if you've looked at the bibliography of the book, well, you could say, I go read some of this other stuff that this author says, either to confirm or deny what it is that I've concluded about this book. And then you reflect on those other materials, and then you bring them into, into play, into consideration, right? And that's how you get to be a person who's not just someone who has opinions, but you have actual evidence-based reflection that leads you to some sort of knowledge or wisdom, but ideally more like wisdom, because as we mentioned earlier, the person who knows is far too self-satisfied with what they know. But the person of wisdom knows that what they know is actually very, very limited in the scope of things and needs more nurture forever. And they're in love with that and they turn it into an adventure. So I hope that helps you with your um, question about reflection. And uh, I don't know what you mean by technique, but uh, I think that ultimately memory techniques if that's what you meant, are about learning them and using them or taking it one sip at a time. Study the techniques, implement them, and practice them with information that changes your life. Maricella says, asks, what is the difference between your new book and the Memory Connection book? Good question. So this book is about the habits that you will use um, to... It's about the memory techniques. It's a detailed memory training about memory palaces and creating magnetic imagery and using recall rehearsal properly. But it's also about how do you turn it into a habit? How do you actually link it to information that improves your life and then show up day after day after day? Hence the title, The Memory Connection. And um, it's to connect it to every area of your life so that you're living the great memory adventure, right? And... Uh, and it's memory improvement that lasts, right? Because that's the thing. People pick things up and then they, they put it aside and they never come back to it. Or they come back to it and they, they, they can't get back into it, etc. But why not get into it in such a way that you stay with it, you stick with it, and it never leaves? That's the goal of the memory connection. And um, the new book, the new book is... Look, I'll be honest. I don't think there's any such book <laughs> that exists in the world like this one. Um, and that may not be a sign of impending success. Uh, and I'm not worried about that because it's just ultimately the book I wanted to write, even though it's not quite right yet. But essentially what it's about is about how memory and meditation combined. Well, what can I say? It, it, it saved my life. And... It ultimately led to being alcohol-free, depression, more or less depression-free. I could almost say 100% depression-free, but I don't think I would say that because if depression is not necessarily a clinical disease. We sometimes just feel depressed, um, but I'm almost entirely free from it. Shocking. It's amazing how that happened. And it almost certainly has to do with bringing memory and meditation together. And one of the arguments in the book and things I hope to demonstrate is that using memory techniques is meditation. But without the goal of meditation and some of the actual meditation practices, which lead to wisdom, by accumulating particular kinds of knowledge, will lead to what is often called liberation. And you've got to be quite modest about what this liberation means because I'm quite aware that what I feel could be gone in a second. And so it's that awareness of how fragile what one accumulates for oneself can be gone. And so all this meditation I do, all the recitation of lots of text every day, it certainly is going to help preserve the health of my brain. But I'm very aware that it also might not save me from Alzheimer's or dementia for a second. I don't know. 
and just be perfectly comfortable with that, with that, with not knowing. So it's partly about how these techniques together can help you release yourself from uncertainty. And so I'm making, like a lot of people, they say, I don't know what to memorize. So I'm going to suggest what you should memorize. And for the first time, I've gone in detail into each and every mnemonic example, which I normally resist doing because it doesn't really help you. But in this case, I think it, w it will be a good idea to do. And as I make clear in the chapter leading up to the examples, not all the examples are exactly the examples that I use because it's impossible. Anyway, there's a big speech there. I think it's hopefully entertaining <laughs> about like why, it, it, like so far in the draft, the chapter is called Why I'd Rather Not help, uh, you know, give you these images or whatever it's going to be in the final chapter. But um, I'm going to give you them anyway. And went to great pains to write it all out. And uh, then I was like, what the heck did I see there? Well, if I could remember what I saw there, uh, it would probably be, have been something like this. Because the whole point is, is it's not about remembering your images. It's about remembering the information, right? But anyway, that's what I go into. But then I also blend in the book how meditation is enhanced by dealing with your diet properly how meditation is enhanced by dealing with many many other things so it's going to it's going to be a book that is very different than than other books um and if i can get you to meditate and memorize and use memory palaces while you're meditating and meditate with particular information all the better or you'll find some other information to me memorize but try these things out cuz i think that you'll have a, I, I predict you'll have a similar outcome. And that outcome is amazing because you just feel really great. And how could you not? Because almost certainly your norepinephrine levels are going to go up in your brain. Your dopamine levels are going to go up in your brain. And uh, uh, the myelin is going to increase in your brain. And it's going to create this habit that's going to be impossible not to do, which has opioid receptors in your brain. And, you know, Sam Harris was talking on uh, his podcast with Daniel, Daniel Kahneman. I didn't hear the name properly, but I got to go and check it back. But he said, you know, that there was a researcher who found what they were calling heroin level meditation techniques. I'm pretty sure that's what I found because I just feel way too good. <laughs> and it's like amazing, right? Anyway, and I know, Marichella, that you're interested in karma yoga. So I get into karma yoga, what that is, but I do it all secular because I don't, I, I think that, that it, and it's very dangerous because people aren't going to, you can say that until you're blue in the face and they're still going to be like, oh, well, you're in touch with, with angels and all that stuff. No, <laughs> don't think so. But uh, I'm self-critical enough to say, well, it's possible. It's possible, but I don't see any evidence for it. But anyway, it's to help people feel good and to show them how memory and meditation, when combined, can do it. And... Um, Look, there are elements of that discussed here, but that's not the focus of this. This doesn't talk about meditation, uh, and it doesn't talk about the breathing in meditation. It doesn't talk about the stretching in meditation. It doesn't talk about the science of meditation. It doesn't talk about diet. It doesn't talk about anything. This is just purely a mechanical manual to making memory training a habit for life, and connecting it through all your life. It talks about the Magnetic Mary Method Life Grid, which is a very important tool and um, helps you actually have a plan for getting it done so that the memory improvement actually lasts, actually lasts. So let me know if you have any more um, questions around that and I'll answer them. Um, Reclaiming Life says... People shouldn't just ask why they personally agree or disagree with something, but also ask why others view things in an opposing manner. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for filling in the gap there. Um, yeah, you've got to, you know, think about what are the pressures, so to speak, the historical, contextual, societal, individual pressures that are forming the ways that people behave and how they behave, and then your own reaction to them and their reaction to you in the cases where that happens. Uh, and you'll you'll have a, a a much more interesting experience of, of what it is that people say and how they say it and you'll just generally be much more knowledgeable and uh, enjoy knowledge much better so reclaiming uh, probably as my love says i've never tried to practice meditation what is a good way to start attempting it well i share my exact journey with it and 
you know, I have a long history with meditation as I talk about, but the thing that really helped me the most, the earliest and with the greatest impact the first time was sitting just to sit and not trying to do anything, not having a goal, just sitting just to sit and then just see what happens study what happens, don't have an opinion about it, not, not, nothing to do with breathing, nothing to do with not having thoughts, anything like that. So just sit, just to sit. Set a timer for 10 minutes. If you think you can sit for 10 minutes, set the timer for eight minutes, right? Just a little less than you think you can and just sit there and see what happens. That's how I would suggest, uh, that is a good way to start. Now, one of the things in the book is I give many, many, many different kinds of meditation. And the thing is, is that not everybody responds to meditation in the same way. And there's different kinds. And so you might want to try a movement meditation. You might want to do stretching first. You might want to do some breathing first. What I'm going to suggest is that you do all of them in a habit chain, right? And that's going to, um, to help you. So Reclaiming Life says, is it that you wanted to write the book or the book that wanted you to write it or, or both? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I have to think in, in my memory because it just suddenly appeared and it seemed like it needed to be written. And it, it, it's, it, well, I mean, I talk about free will in the book and really insofar as there is a guy who has any, it just started to appear. Um, and... As it was appearing, I, I realized that uh, that it needed to be a, a book. So really, the origins of it were um, some some teaching that I was doing, and how impactful that was for people, and then all the questions that came out of it. And so then I thought, well, I, I should have this all in a dedicated book. Also, what happened is. So, the, you know, that's why it appears, right? So it's not like there are a lot of acts of will involved, but I had no free will in its appearance because it's just like the, the world is pushing you in this direction. It's the next obvious thing to do. Uh, and so it just starts to get done uh, in some sense. And then there it is. Now the first draft is back from, from the editor and I'm just like, yeah, well, change a little bit of this, change a bit of that. And, you know, getting some Memory Palace drawings from some of you to put in it. And, uh, yeah. Anyway, can go on and on. But the most direct answer to your question is that it just started to appear because it was the most obvious thing to do. Um, next. And I already know what the next two books will be because uh, they're obviously also the next thing to do. I just don't know exactly when they will get done or how. Um, but they, they are certainly the most obvious books to be written. I have no end of ideas for books. I often just think of like, which is the next one? Which should it be? But there's no end of ideas. All right. Marichella says, I can say I do not know what is depression, but I know what it is being worried because of life things like pain, bills, tests, family, etc. Well, some of these techniques may change how you experience worry. I would say like, that's a good, interesting comment because I feel like worry has, has gone away and it's irrational. It's irrational. I, I, don't, I, I don't talk about it in the book, but I remember when April had to go to the hospital and I was just like completely freaked out and yet I was calm at the same time. I was concerned and worried and yet it, it's a weird experience. It's, uh, it's, it's strange. It's almost like one of the dark sides of, of these practices, if there is one, is that you become quite indifferent in some way. It's not indifference, though. Discerning. But it's like you're involved, but you're not involved. But that's because you've just discovered that there is no you, right? And you, these, these are things just happening in the world. They're appearing in the world. And uh, you're just not really involved in them because, <laughs> because they're just there. And it's just a weird feeling. And scientifically, this is probably what Sam Harris is referring to with the heroin level meditation techniques because in the spiritual books they will say oh yes 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 well that's because you have now connected with the divine universe and blah 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 i'm not so convinced of that i think more likely you're just totally your brain is just producing 
powerful chemicals that essentially make you high as a kite without inebriation. Although some people certainly do get inebriated and their critical thinking skills are certainly eroded because the next thing you know, they're asking you to buy pictures of their feet, <laughs> if not kiss your feet. So obviously there's people who get deranged from these mental states that they've created. So you've got to keep your mind open, but not so f open that your brain falls out. Um, but if you can get rid of some of that worry or reduce the impact of the worry in your life, awesome. I just wouldn't, I, I, and that, that's another reason why I'm writing the book is because, is because I'm very concerned about how that there's so much nonsense stuff out there and to do my part to help promote critical thinking and to show my own need for critical thinking because, you know, the, the, these, these states that I've created through these forms of meditation, they certainly raise some wacky ideas. Uh, there's no doubt about that. All right. Piazmadov says, curing depression. Was it severe depression? If so, more power to you. Yeah, well, wait till you read the book because there's a story there I never shared before. And uh, it was severe, let me tell you. I'm a lucky guy to be around, as a matter of fact. And uh, thanks, to, thanks to someone who theoretically endangered himself to, to grab me. So, um, yeah. Crazy stuff. And, uh, you know, who knows? The world operates in strange ways. So Maricela says, I was reading depression and symptoms, and I have some symptoms, but I cannot believe it is depression. Well, yeah, I mean, reading and self-diagnosing has its place, I suppose, but if you feel sad from time to time, it, yeah, it's not necessarily depression. Like I said earlier, I, I wouldn't say that I've completely removed my depression because being depressed is a natural thing. It's something that happens. Blue, once in a while. Um, it can just happen. Pi is my love sitting. That does not seem like neurosurgery. No, it's definitely not neurosurgery. It's very easy. It's, it, it's just sitting just to sit and you can get more elaborate. I mean, one, um, simple thing you can do if you want to do some breathing that it doesn't require you to concentrate so much because there are breathing concentration exercises that I teach, but you can add some breathing if you want, which is just to close off one nostril and uh, just breathe like this and then close off the other one and then exhale through the alternate nostril. When I couldn't concentrate, that was a great way of changing your mental state a little bit and just alternate that. Later, you can focus on doing it in your, in your mind, just like I'm pretending I'm breathing in just through one nostril and then pretending I'm breathing out of just one nostril. And you'll find that that's quite pleasant. And I find that I just catch myself breathing that way now all the time. I've done it so much that it just seems to happen automatically. Mahesh says, how to stay feeling good when we study and away for long-term memory? Great questions, Mahesh. Let's grab them. And if you're joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. And uh, we'll answer this question and any last ones that come in. So if you've got something, start to type it. And if you hear that as the goodbye call, well then, see ya. But I'm going to answer this question and anything else that comes in while I'm answering it. And I uh, appreciate all of you being here today. But it's lunchtime and those deadlifts I did this morning, they are calling me to eat. All right. So um, let's see how to stay feeling good when we study. Well, here's the first thing I would suggest. Let go of the need to feel good. What universal law said that you were going to feel good while you're studying? Just let it go. Feel bad while you're studying. Just get it done. Now, I'm not saying you should feel bad, but just let go of the need for anything to be any way, right? Um, and that's really, really important. And that's part of what we talked about today, being self-observant, noticing yourself, and being very, very aware of your states, and just accepting that they are there. And then if you are, you know, still not feeling great, think about what you could do to make yourself feel great. Could you sit in a better 
chair? Could you sit in a better location? Could you, uh, you know, have some nice water there that you enjoy? Like I just love Bai Kai Shui, which is um, what I'm drinking now. Mm. It's very Bai Kai Shui delicious. <laughs> and um, uh, you just have comforts things, things that comfort you. And then you sit down and you do it. So let go of the need and then think of your environment. Think, do you, do you have some nice things that you, that, that, you, that you like, that comfort you? And do you have a strategy? Do you have a plan? Do you, do you actually have, have what you need? Do you have the memory techniques, for example? And the way for long-term memory, look, there's, there's a several things that you want to consider. Um, and this will make you feel good, uh, for sure, if you do it is you have a memory palace network. It's the most amazing thing in the world. And then you use the memory palace to help you encode through elaborative encoding or magnetic imagery creation, the information as you go along. And then you use recall rehearsal to make that information get into long-term memory. And you do it to the point that you can't stop yourself doing it and it's gonna create all kinds of beautiful brain chemicals and you're just gonna look at any text and you're gonna be like, this is so boring, but I can memorize it anyway, right? I can read in red, I can read in blue. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can read anything I want too, regardless of what's going on, right? I think he says, <laughs> I got to memorize this one of these days. I think he says, you can read in pickle color too. I can read in purple and in brown. I can read in bed and upside down, something like that. I got to memorize it. Beautiful, beautiful text. Um, but you can just memorize what you want. And you can do it in a way that makes you feel great. And you can do it in a way that will help you for life. All right. Kiragami says, hello, Anthony. I'm using your memory techniques and they're amazing. I had a question. I'm always anxious whenever I go in public. What should I do to cure my anxiety? Okay, great. Well, I suffered a lot of anxiety as well. Talk about that in the next book and uh, why that it happened. And that's one thing is like, do you know a history? Have you thought about the history of why it's happening to you? Because I was, fortunately, I was aware of some of the historical reasons why that was happening to me, um, which I share in the book and go into the story. And it's a very dramatic story. I hope it's written in a way that's entertaining for you. Um, and as is the cure, so to speak. But, you know, one of the things that I learned and did CBT, which is co cognitive behavior therapy at some level, um, is to just n notice what's happening there. Noticing what's happening there and giving it a name and a label and a tag and, ah, there's that again, right? That's it's more useful than you'd imagine. And then when you study your behaviors around it, you may notice you have some avoidance strategies. Label them too. Ah, there, I'm doing something to avoid it. So I'll share with you something that's in the book. Uh, I used to have a hard time with subways. Like I just had this impulse to jump, 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 jump in front of subways all the time. It's called harm OCD, uh, or that's one name for it. It's worse than anxiety, but I'd get really anxious. Like just having to go to the subway, my palms would sweat like crazy. And one of the things you learn to do is notice that. And then I never really thought about it, but like I would stand in particular ways. I would stay up on the stairs and uh, wait to hear it come in. I knew in my mind exactly where it would be so that by the time that I came down the stairs, the train would be already in, right? So I didn't look like a total moron. But I, so I'd like stand up, hear, wait and listen, come halfway down, go back up, all this stuff. And I started to learn the, those were avoidance behaviors and start to notice, ah, I'm doing the avoidance behavior and uh, come up with other strategies. So that's another thing. So first, n n look at the history. Where did this come from in your life? Then what, a, what exactly is it that you're experiencing? Give it a label. Be able to label it when it arises. And then what are your strategies for dealing with it? How are you behaving around it? And start to describe that to yourself. And then pick the smallest change that you can make and start to make it. And uh, yeah, that should... Well, also go see a doctor. None of what I just said is medical advice and uh, you need to get proper medical advice uh, for sure. It's um, it's very important because I did and uh, I didn't like what I heard. I didn't like what I was told to do, but it helped. And 
it's helped many times since because sometimes these things come back when you're tired or whatever, and then you have strategies. So hope that helps you out. Um, and certainly when my book comes out, it'll help you even more because there's a lot more that I did, but that's pretty much the basics. And again, see a doctor, especially if it's as bad as mine was. All right. Mr. Space is in the house from Queens. I, I got to learn a Queens accent. Thank you for the live stream you say. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for saying hello. Always good to see you. And uh, new, not, not so much Queens, but certainly New York was where I had some of my subway nightmare <laughs> experiences. Uh, and Amechi says, how can I use a memory palace while listening to a medical class lecture? Great question. So one of the things you would want to do is have multiple memory palaces, not one, five, seven, 9,000. Um, someone was asking Ron Wright the other day, how many, what, what I would call magnetic stations he has. And I think he said 2,500, right? Um, he said, most people won't need that. And I, I would say, no, most people won't. I would agree, but they should have them anyway because it'll help you so much. And the problem with that advice of like, well, most people don't need that. What does most people mean? How do you know what, who is who? You don't know. This person may be, um, may be going to get a graduate degree 20 years from now, and then they might need that, that. They might actually need that. So why shouldn't all people be prepared? Everybody knows how to tie their shoelaces. Right? So that's important. Harvinder is in the house. Good to see you, Harvinder. Thanks for saying hello. Um, and then, you know, you, when you're listening to a, a medical class and you um, have your memory palaces in place, well, you can record the lecture and encode the information in your memory palace later. Or you can do some encoding in real time if you get to that level. Or you can do a little bit of both. Record the lecture, record your notes in a particular way, and start doing the encoding. Just doing elaborative encoding as things are going on, even if it's not the full elaborative encoding that's going to do the big, the big job later, is really useful because you're associating as you go along. And you can associate with space. You can also use the medical class lecture hall as the memory palace. So give that a try. And let's see here. Uh, Mahesh asks how to stay alpha state when we study. And Mr. Space says just be in, in alpha state. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about all these states and whatnot. And I'm not sure that those are the goals that one should have. Rather, the goal I would recommend you have is be really, really good with your memory. Be able to use your memory on the dime when you need to. And that means being prepared in such a way that you don't need to use it on a dime, but you still can if you need to. All right. Kirigami says, thank you so much. I'll get, work on it. Seeing a doctor has always been a troublesome venture. Doctors here are known to get their patients stuck with them or wrongly diagnose the diseases. Well, Kirigami, unfortunately, that's the way it is everywhere, not just there. But there's no reason not to go anyway and see multiple doctors. And... Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've also been damaged by doctors. Don't don't get me wrong, but by the same token, you can think critically about them in ways that I couldn't. And you know, sometimes my blind faith in science crippled me, uh, so to speak. It wasn't really blind faith. I just didn't know enough about science at that time. But um, one thing that you want to do is still seek out some external help and. And then have your baloney detection kit with you and don't necessarily do what they say. They're, they're, doctor means teacher. It's derived from the word teacher uh, or a word that means teacher. And so they're there to teach you some stuff. And then you as a student, a diligent student who has proper critical thinking skills, you go out and you cross index that with other information in the world. You craft the plan based on what you've learned and what you've been taught. And quite frankly, the reality is, is that there are people who have gone through levels of study, even if they've gone through it in ways that are not as grand and as thorough as we would like, who just have access to knowledge in their minds that we're never going to have because we don't know the books to read and yada, yada, yada. So what you want to do is go and um, get what they say and then follow up with it on your own 
and cross index with other professionals and you'll find terms and books and references that you probably will never find on the internet by going to speak with a professional and uh so that's why uh, that's another reason i would recommend that to you mahesh says is this book available in india this book yes uh i will send it to you because i am in control of sending the last copies so make sure you get one and uh if you have any more questions about it let me know mr space says is repetition important for remembering or one dramatic image is good enough well that's a good question because yes, repetition is important for remembering, but there's creative repetition and there's rote repetition. And you, you know, it really has some role to play repetition one way or the other. And here's why. You're, if you're going to memorize it, it should be because you're going to repeat it, right? What would be the point of memorizing something that wasn't going to get repeated? So at its base level, there's always repetition involved. Then repetition strategically using repetition is what a memory palace is for memory palaces are for repetition but they're for creative repetition that is actually working to reduce the amounts of repetition that you need to do and maximize the outcome of the repetition that you do very very powerful and you do that by harnessing primacy effect recency effect through the use of serial positioning effect in order to make sure that every piece of information has all of those features, ideally with the von Reschdorf effect. And that's a lot of terminology that I just threw at you, but that's how it works. Space repetition doesn't do that properly, and it can't because it's a machine, but humans can do it properly. And they don't need machines because they can make memory palaces, lickety split, two minutes or less, boom. The best space repetition machine in the world right here and where does it live well partly right there but mostly right here and so away we go all right so that's the answer to that question and oh and the other thing is, is in terms of reducing the amount of repetition um yeah you can reduce it significantly especially when you use levels of processing effect which we've talked about many times before so and i usually call levels of processing effect the big five of learning, which is essentially reading, re speaking, writing, reading, and listening into memory and out of memory. Kiragami says, thank you so much. I'll work on it. You are the best. Awesome. Do it. Work on it. And uh, thrive and prosper. Enjoy the process. It is the process that you have to work with. And it is going to be an amazing, amazing adventure in and of itself for the enrichment of your own life and the lives of everyone around you. And that's another thing that can help you reduce your anxiety in life is to give to others without expectation of an outcome, just to serve, serve the world. The best thing that you can do is to serve others. And uh, that'll help reduce anxiety. And if you don't believe me, just go give it a try. See what happens. Thank you, Mr. Space, for your thank you. I'm so glad to hear that your my courses have improved your memory very much, and I appreciate you saying so. Appreciate your great question. And um, yeah, you can work on those numbers of repetitions and reduce them, but don't be too sure, don't be too sure, don't be too sure. That's the policy I always have in mind. Give it that extra go, and um, make sure you don't cheat. Like, I'm trying a, a slightly new approach here, but you'll notice that this doesn't have um, the answer on the back. It has the magnetic imagery. I don't have to look at it because I, I did memorize it the first time. But um, I, I just put, instead of the answer, I put the magnetic imagery on the back. Likewise with this, magnetic imagery on the back. It's so fast, so elegant, so effective and fun. And it's this little baby that makes the whole thing run. All right, everybody. Thank you for being here today. I think I'm going to go read. I can read with my eyes shut and maybe uh, commit a bit of it to memory because it's a lot of fun. Thank you for mentioning that, uh, uh, William, amazing uh, little, little thing that you brought up into my mind. And I'm going to go and read Still Alice, which uh, it's suggesting some great brain exercises, actually. And uh, We'll catch up here with the last comment from Maricella, who says, I do not like hospitals, doctors, and policemen. I always try to eat healthy, to not be sick. I like to drink 
two to three cups of coffee during the day. I'm not sure if coffee is good. I'm not going to comment on coffee today, but uh, I certainly enjoy coffee. And I'm not going to push back on your dislike of hospitals, doctors, and policemen, other than to say, yeah, they've got some caca on their knees, but we can be grateful for the good stuff that's there. And probably if you know the 80-20 rule, it's a lot more good than we think. Even if we continue to dislike them, we should pay them their due because there's a lot of people who work really hard and have worked hard historically to make things like hospitals and enforcement of the law and enforcement of health. And they have hard life too. And uh, it's not right. It's not perfect. And there's a lot of injustices and there's a lot of malpractices and there's a lot of the stuff. But I am quite convinced that it's a lot less than we think. And even if we don't like them, we should be critical of our dislike. And as uh, um, Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya, puts it in the book Atma Bodha, the like-dislike monster will get you every time. So <laughs> we've got to watch out for the like-dislike monster. And a lot of what we talked about today is um, about critical thinking and catching your own dislike of things so that you can read. And so to reiterate about our reading strategies and reading t uh, techniques. Don't have an opinion about so many things. Just try the strategies and get that like-dislike monster and put it in its place and just get it done. Get it done. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Come get the free memory kit at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT if you're new. This is going to end very, very soon because there's less than half a box left. If you want to get one, Now's the time. Let me know by email after you get it if you want it signed. It's going to be two to four weeks before you get your copy just because of the mail and stuff. And we're waiting till the last thing and we're going to sign them all. I've already got a bunch signed here just to make sure that uh, it's for the right person and the right signature. There's a little ripped up index card. I don't like to rip index cards, but it was awesome to do. So we got a whole pile of ones that we're signing and uh, it's uh, a lot of fun to... to uh, personalize them for you. And um, yeah, then you will just hear me talking for three to five months as I edit the next book. And uh, that becomes out there. And, uh, you know, I've got to do the audio book and all kinds of stuff. But um, always a pleasure meeting with you today. And every day that we meet is today, isn't it? So enjoy the now, enjoy the now. And uh, I will, uh, yeah, Maricella, you were getting a, 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 a certain version of it, um, which is uh, related to that, which is not a physical copy. So if you want a physical copy, make sure that you get one. And uh, that's uh, how that works. But you should have received uh, that version that you're getting. Uh, but thanks for asking about it. Anyway, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. And until we have a chance to speak again, as I always like to say, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.